So before we get into how you two first met, I'm curious about when you first encountered each other by reputation. Um, Steve, do you recall how and when you would have initially come across Ian's name? Uh, I, I met Lyle Pressler, who was the guitar player in Minor Threat, when he, was, uh, he came to college at Northwestern. I was ignorant of the D.C. hardcore scene, and uh, I met Lyle... He was an assigned roommate of a guy that I had run into through the school newspaper who ended up being Nate from Urge Overkill. And Completely coincidental, by the way. Yeah. I mean, those guys, I mean, Lyle just went to college and he got ended up being roommates with Nate, which is bonkers. Hmm. Yeah. And I met Lyle through Nate and Lyle introduced me to Minor Threats music and uh, then I saw, subsequently, Lyle left school and i saw a minor threat play in chicago the next time they came through um right. and i i think i probably would have talked to lyle afterward but i i don't i don't think i met ian until i think i probably actually met you through loader at southern right no i think i met you uh the first time we met was uh at Corey's house i'm pretty sure i mean Corey and lisa had that house up, oh uh, right was, right right um, um I, in I, Ann I Arbor, don't think right? I, no, 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 no. This would have been um, not Ann Arbor. It was it was in Chicago. It was up like up north. Like where was the house? Oh, okay. they had in, was it Halstead or something? I don't know. It was somewhere up there. Yeah, yeah. That was they had a right. when right after Touch and Go moved to Chicago. I thought we had met before that. Like you were doing know. Palehead or something at Southern right after well, my Palehead, trip. Yeah, broke but up. Palehead maybe. Yeah, that'd be right because I did Palehead in eighty. Were you there when Jurgensen was there? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that would have been <laughs> yeah, that would have been eighty. That was nineteen eighty-seven. Yeah, that makes sense. And then that I guess we right. came out. And I guess I guess yeah, I guess that's right. We would have come. Then Fugazi came in spring of eighty-eight. Mm-hmm. Um, that's weird. I've forgotten that you were in, in, out there at that time. Were you, what were you working on out there? Um, uh, Big Black's last recording session was in eighty. This like the. Spring of eighty seven, maybe. Were you mixing it out in in London? Oh no! I now I remember what it was. We were. I remember playing yeah, football. I don't, with I don't, remember, what, I don't remember what it was. Fuck! All I know is that I had heard of. I mean, I <clears throat> I knew Lyle had gone to college. He lasted there for six months. Then he came back and reformed Minor Threat. And he had mentioned meeting people out there, but I didn't know he did. You know, I didn't. I didn't have any sense of who those people were at all. Um, and then I guess, um, my Threat played, we played, well, we played Chicago two times, once in 1981, prior to you, you, uh, you guys meeting in college, we played at O'Banion's. Um, right. And that, show, sh- that show was kind of legendary by the time I found out about it. Right. And I guess wasn't, didn't Santiago do sound or something for that show? Right. Naked Ray right. had a practice PA in the, their coach house and they would haul it to... They would do punk shows with it as like a rental PA. Right. And I guess Kedsey put that show on. Um, that makes sense. Or Babin, one of those two. No, it's Kedsey for sure. Cause All right. He was furious with me because I, I badmouthed <laughs> Chicago about it because they wouldn't let, it wasn't all ages. And we snuck a bunch of people through the side door when we started playing. And he was furious. I, I think I've, I still have letters from him angry wow. at me about that whole night. But, um, but then, uh, I think I really got to know your name through your writing. Um, well, actually, I knew. I guess I knew um, the band, but then you were writing for. Um, did you write for Matter? First exposure in Matter, yeah. And you you gave Right to Spring a sort of a slag. Yeah, they were awful. Yeah, uh huh. And uh, <laughs> man, and we were really like, I was like, how this is crazy. Like, I I was just shocked that you know that I mean, I'd heard of you, but I was in, But it's also an era of the meme zine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Force exposure and matter and all these. Everyone was just being really kind of the reviewing reviewers were pretty were pretty tough. So then, my first time really remember. I remember meeting you like when Fugazi came. We were staying at Corey's, or maybe I was just at Corey's. But I remember talking to you, and you were a very nice guy. We had a really it was a really nice visit. You know, I, that's what I remember. It was just being like, well, that's a nice guy. Even if he wrote a mean review of Rights of Spring, which was one of the greatest bands of all time. <laughs> you were aware when you met him at Corey's house that he was the author of this review? No, oh, of course, yeah. 
Probably. I, mean, yeah. I, I, I knew who Steve was. I'd seen. In fact, I saw. Uh, did when did Big Black come to Washington? I don't. Times, right? I'm really, really awful. We were there a couple of times. We played at the 930. DC, we played it. There was another. What was there was played another DC space. DC space, right? We played it. Yeah, DC space I saw. The yeah, first I saw time. that show. I mean, I was at that Big Black show, and I saw. I mean, I may see the. So that would have been like too. 86, maybe 85, somewhere in there. So I guess I yeah, I guess we had crossed paths, but I don't know. If, mm. So I knew who Steve was at that point, certainly. And so you you each saw each other's. Bands, uh, early bands, Minor Threat and Big Black. What, uh, Steve? What did you make of Minor Threat? They were about. I mean, there were a very, very small number of hardcore bands that that I could stomach, and they were at the very top of that group. Like there were a half a dozen hardcore bands that sort of elevated the form and made it like non-trivial. The bulk of hardcore, uh, I I thought was you know vacant you know really just stylistic stuff with no substance to it a lot of a lot of sort of me too kind of crap but uh minor threat uh, there were a half dozen bands that were that you could call hardcore bands that were incredible like uh minor threat void bad brains decroits and and it gets really thin after that you know, Bad Brains obviously got the ball rolling, and but Minor Threat were the very best of the, the sort of super pissed off hardcore mm-hmm. bands. And Ian, uh, I presume Big Black might have stuck out when you saw them. Of course, I mean, they were they were totally, um, you know, they they confronted the form in a way that was is you know almost upsetting. It was so intense, like the drum machine aspect of it was so ruthless and the, you know they were loud and they were and they were and they were you know their presentation was really um in my mind the way i recall it just being like it's like one of those shows where you i would go and just feel i would feel like really threatened in a way just by like you know just and trying to understand what you know what the fuck these guys are up to you know and i mean it was a great they're i enjoyed the shows they were really but they were weird because i'm i'm like a really like i was coming from a really um like I'm, I'm like machines are always. I always have trouble, especially rhythmic machines. I find they're so unrelenting, and I'm very interested in like the heartbeat. So I like a little bit of a, I like things to slide around, you know, like the, in the terms of rhythms. But the the big black thing was so in your face, um, and so I don't know, almost like vertical. Like it just, it just, it just came cutting right at you. And uh, well, I think at the time there was this, there was a. There was a particular thing that we were reacting against. Like a lot of a lot of punk stuff was kind of positioning itself by what it was against. You know, like in a in a and you know, sort of by and by default, what you ended up being in favor of or what you were what you were representing, right? But what at the time there was a, a kind of a, a thing in the in the underground music scene and the punk scene where people wanted to like sort of fit in. You know, so you'd see a lot of people wearing stylistic stuff that their friends were wearing as clothing and i my interest in punk sort of predated that when it was when things were more sort of more uh random i guess like my introduction to punk was were a hundred bands none of whom sounded alike and all of whom looked different and you know and then when punk started to get formalized and hardcore started to formalize it we were reacting against this um some people would call it conformity. I wouldn't call it conformity. I would call it like an an impulse to fit in. You know, there's a there was a a, a thing like where, I mean, it, and it manifested itself in a bunch of different ways. Like you had bands like, um, like I don't know, like REM and the Replacements and bands like that, where they were like trying to dumb down or trying to like pretty up some of these adventurous impulses in order to make it sort of acceptable or make it more and and we were we were kind of expressing the opposite impulse which is like to revel in being outside and to like be manifestly apart rather than be in, be inclusive and inside something and i think that's what dif- what differentiated us from uh, other bands at the time which is weird i mean i mean i say that because well, that was sort of an aesthetic bands, thing there's certainly other. I mean, I share that with you, by the way. Like, I totally. My first introduction to punk was so wide ranging and so, like, I my mind was being blown 
could everything fit, but it was all oppositional in its own way. Um, mm. All these different bands. I think that in a way you could think of it as conformity. I also think you could think of it as like the voting block. Like at some point it just became like the thing that made the difference. It tipped, it really tipped it over and suddenly it became something that was this huge, like it created a new, um, there's a new environment in which then like bands like yours and also like Buttholes, Meat Puppets, there were right. a lot of bands that were really poking out in a way that was really challenging. And I, that's what I, I really responded to that. Like you can, I mean, for as many hardcore bands that you, you may have seen, I probably saw even more because they were open. <laughs> yeah, us. I can and, imagine. Right. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of, and people were very influenced by Meyer Threat, which I of course take as a, and I, I'm sure you've had this experience with, you know, in your band where people, you get paired with them. You're like, okay, well, you know, thanks. We actually had that kind of covered, you know, when they opened for <laughs> yeah. you, but, um, yeah. but, um, but, uh, the, uh, and Fugazi was certainly the case too, where we played a lot of bands that were very, very influenced by Fugazi, which I'm flattered by, but also sort of again a little weird to have them opening for you. Um, but the uh, so I think that at that time in the mid '80s, you know the the punk thing that was like the early '80s, like the '81, '82, that that era was so. Um, it was very inclusive. I felt like it was like in my mind, like not. <clears throat> I don't think it was conformist. I felt like people were so hungry to connect with each other, and mm. this was the currency. But then once people started to connect, then things started to go like there was two trajectories within the punk scene, at least or the hardcore punk scene. One was sort of this very kind of almost like photocopied kind of music like you just see everyone's on the same kind of like the breakdown for the the moshing part of whatever the kind of right, the right, musically right. style stylistically obviously the look was thing but then you also had this other component which was um a lot of like the violence became really parodied and 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 uh, you know when violence is a parody of itself it becomes even more violent um and there was like this really sort of terrible like dark thing happening in the in music uh or in the un punk underground i should say uh by the i think in the by 83 or 84 there were people like I, fuck this we're not going to be involved with this anymore and they just started breaking out um and you know i first saw the the buttholes in 80 i saw them in 80 1981 i think or 82 i saw mm -hmm. them in, in los angeles and they freaked the fuck out of me when I saw when them. they first started they were such a revelatory band like they were it was this this really incredible human experience seeing them play yes. just they were you know it was like what like watching a contortionist or something you know just like people like not not just like making interesting music or breaking the form or whatever the punk music paradigm was but it was like they were sort of putting themselves through something watching them on stage and it was a really great like you know really exuberant but also really like kind of wrenching thing to see and that you know that was one of the great disappointments of the punk scene was when bands who had that capability or who had that as part of their uh as as part of their pedigree realized they could get away mm. with faking it you know, right. like when they they realized okay. they could just have a light show and then, right. you know, that would be and that would be like they sort of established their credentials as being a freak show or as being something, you know, genuine. And then it's like, well, as long as we turn up and there's a light show, then we'll be fine. You know, so like when I saw when I saw Big Black, like for me, like think about that's where Big Black fit in for me. It was like it wasn't it was like I think of music like as, as a conversation. So like people have ideas, musical ideas, and then they they put them out there, and then someone says, "Okay, I hear you, and I'm up in you." Like, or I'm gonna, I'm this is how I respond. And <laughs> you know, in Washington, that was always like early in the '80s. That was always like all through like the genesis of the Washington punk scene. Really, was people seeing each other, having their mind like seeing a band, having your mind blown, and then going to the practice room like, "Okay, let's fuck them up. Let's do something now." So in a way, like what was happening in the '80s, mid '80s, I started seeing bands. And, you know, Big Black was certainly one of them where I just was, you know, I was like, whoa, like, you know, you know, they, they're they just bringing it in a way that was so intense. And, you know, I'm a pop kind of guy. I like I have a pop sensibility. Big Black did not have as much of a pop sensibility, um, but it was so it was like it was riveting. And it was like it was the kind of thing where I was like, like, you know, really, you know, had to try and understand, like, you know, 
where are they coming from and where are they trying to go with this? Because it was it was very powerful. And, it was, and the room they played in, by the way, I should point out, was this place called D- I saw in DC Space. It was a very small restaurant. Right. And, um, so there was like one, know, of, those, were, one know, of those places where there was like. Them. It was that? one of those places that was. It was one of those places where there was like, like a little platform rather than right. an actual stage. Mm. You right. Know? So you're just standing in basically in a living room with them, just getting your face blown off. Right. So particularly intense. And earlier we talked about, or you guys mentioned the band Palehead, which Ian was a sort of an electronic punk collaboration with Al Jorgensen of Ministry. <laughs> and it never occurred to me before we were speaking today, but was Big Black an influence on Palehead in any way? Uh, not that I, I mean, my, I would think indirectly at best, you know. Yeah, I guess so. The, here's the thing about the my. Let me explain something about the pale thing because it's so that whole situation is so surreal. I was in London. I guess we should first off. There's a a guy named John Loder, who's died in, what ten years ago now, mm-hmm. 2005 yeah. when he died. Mm-hmm. Um, who was, I mean, I think of this guy almost every day still. He's a very important figure in my life and. He ran a company called Southern Studios, and John came to see Minor Threat in 1983, and he was very interested in releasing Minor Threat records uh, in England. Uh, And we were in a pinch with the label, Discord, because we were incapable of keeping up with the demand, uh, and we had no, since we were not really a business, we had no way to get credit at record plant, so we had to pay COD. So we would press up records, we'd sell them all out immediately, we had to pay immediately for the you know the, the records. We sell them all to distributors, and then they just dog us for six months or something. So we had a real problem with our flow. Like we couldn't keep things in print. We had bands lined up waiting for us. So when John came to see us and expressed his interest in um, releasing our record in England, we asked him, "Hey, could you press like a couple extra thousand and ship them to us?" So we can sell them. We need records. We don't have. No, we can't press our own records. Even though we're sold, we're sold out of everything. We don't have. We can't actually repress. We don't have any money because it's all hung up in this. You know, this terrible distribution situation. And and we started working with him, and he became really like our partner. He pressed almost all of the records for the next you know fifteen or twenty years. We worked with him for twenty five years. Yeah, um, you really can't overstate how important Southern was for like the the underground music scene in America. I mean, Southern is an English company run by run in London by an English guy, but he did international distribution for a bunch of American labels and right. di- and also facilitated touring and gave bands a crash pad and ended up recording a whole mess of records. Uh, I mean, his studio was probably the most productive punk studio and the records that came out of there always sounded great. You know, they always had very high technical standards. That, that's how I first heard about him, actually, was he was doing, Southern was doing all the early independent label UK releases, like all the, uh, I mean, he was affiliated with the band Crass, so all of that stuff, but also, you know, Small Wonder and Rough Trade and um, 4AD, like all these small independent record labels that were just doing a really um, incredible a variety of music, different kinds of music, and all of it was done like whenever you'd hear a good sounding record, if you look on the back, it was recorded at Southern, you know. Right. And it was really, John was a, you know, John was an incredible engineer. Like he was just a really, and he, and he, and mostly he just loved, he loved music and he loved people. He was just a really sweet yeah. guy. And he was really, and, really uh, loved but, being in the, ingrained in the culture of the underground music scene. Like it meant, you know, it meant nothing for him to like drop everything and fly to America to see a show. You know, like right. he would do that spontaneously. Hmm. And, you know, he was, you know, he's a bit older. I mean, I think he was about 59 when he died. Does that sound right, Steve? Something like that, yeah. So he's probably, so he's, you know, hmm. he's 15 years older than us, I guess, somewhere in that area. And yeah. um, so he was really, that guy was just a really, um, he was a huge fan, but he also just, he just was, he just loved, yeah, he loved being involved. Um and he was a real supporter. Like, you know, he would, you know, pick bands up from the airport. And, you know, he was just a great guy. So yeah. Discord really threw in with him. And then Touch and Go also, like, you know, because I'm very good friends with Corey. And Touch and Go was a label that we were – Discord and Touch and Go had a real affinity. So they worked together as well. I don't know if that's how you – if you know that was your connection with him going out there. I assume it was. Um, but any of it, I – John, you know, they had this house. I stayed at the house in – it was in North London – um, an area called Wood Green, 
and in the garage of the house was the studio and the there was um and sort of the house was actually two houses one house was the was the operations of the of the uh of southern studios which was the uh they had like a label they had a distribution company they had a production company it was all in this one house and the garage was the studio itself so i was visiting and staying with the loaders and was um hanging out with somebody who worked there and we were in the the sort of common kitchen area making a cup of tea and this guy came out of the uh, studio and I was introduced to him as Al from ministry. I had heard of ministry because I used to work in a record store and I knew their Arista stuff, which was um, like this sort of college. I think of like college, like really pretty like soft college electronic dance stuff or something. I don't know. I didn't really, I, I don't, yeah, I didn't care about any of that stuff. I didn't, you know, I knew it because I sold the records, but I don't know. Any, I didn't know anything about ministry at all beyond that they were on Arista and there was some kind of softy kind of dance stuff. And um, so I was introduced to uh, Al and Al said, oh, I'm really getting into hardcore, which I didn't make any sense to me that he would say something like that because I just didn't make, yeah, how would that be? Um, mm -hmm. And it was also at a time where I was really feeling... <laughs> pretty disillusioned by what would people called hardcore so it kind of made perfect <laughs> sense that he would say i'm getting into hardcore um, <laughs> as if it was something you could slip on like a jacket or something you know um but he uh he asked you know he said oh you want to hear some of the stuff i'm working on and he was working on this uh, revolting cox record i think and it was so damaged sounded not at all what i was expecting and then he played this one track and he said you know hey do you want to write a set of lyrics for this one song um and it was i gotta say it was a pretty damn good song and i and it just caught me at a moment in my life where you know i didn't i was sort of unaffiliated it was 1986 that's when it was i remember i was not like i was joe and i had started practicing with a different drummer but we were not in a band like we were just playing music together i was unaffiliated and i had nothing really i was like I just took the, he gave me a cassette. I went in the house that night, I listened to it and I wrote a set of lyrics. Cause it, it was sort of like, if you don't, if you're not in a band, it's so easy to write a fucking set of lyrics. You're not answering to anybody. So I just wrote this set of lyrics and I went down and I said, okay, I can sing this song. And I sang on it. Um, I was, you know, I liked the song. He was, I think really struck by the fact that I was like, I have like, you know, I paced it. Like I, my, Timing was good. I mean, I know how to sing fast songs and I rhyme, you know, that's my, you know, that's my thing. So, so I think Al was really <laughs> pretty blown away by it. Uh, my assumption was that he was going to be putting this on his revolting Cox record at a later date. I was contacted by wax tracks and said, Hey, we want to do a B side and do us a separate, like a d separate project. Cause it sounds, we love it so much. So I went to Chicago. I think it was at that time that I realized that there was like, um, the Jurgensen and Wax Tracks and were not exactly like best friends with the Touch and Go people, you know. Which I just didn't. I had never really thought about it. I just didn't know. Well, I didn't know. I mean, so the, I didn't know. the thing, yeah. the thing that's weird about that sort of internecine thing was that Wax Tracks, as a record lay, as a record store, was absolutely critical to the punk scene in Chicago. Like that's the record store Wax Tracks, you know. And Al Jurgensen worked there as a you know who worked behind the counter there for years. And the but Wax Tracks the store and Jim and Danny as people were absolutely instrumental to the early punk scene in right. Chicago. Amazing people. Yeah, really Amazing. interesting. Really just dedicated, just in love with music. Really, you know, they put would, out the Strike Under record. Come on, they put out the Strike Under. They they brought bands like they brought the the Birthday Party and Bauhaus and they brought these bands over to America on their own nickel so that they could play shows. You know that I mean that's kind of incredible, but. Um, and then there developed this bizarre thing where Wax Tracks, the store, and the people that worked there sort of transformed into this club music record label. And the drug scene got really heavy, and the, the it was just like a it was like an alternate reality version of a of a music scene that didn't seem to relate to what wax tracks had been about when it was a punk record store at all you know it was a really baffling thing really to see how it went from being this sort of linchpin thing to being this bizarre kind of uh 
parallel and alien thing that a, a, a lot of people who were involved in the punk scene in Chicago didn't take to the club culture. And I'm, you know, I'm one of those people. I really, it, it missed me. And I, and I thought all, all of it was stupid. I thought all the music was stupid. I thought all the people were stupid. I thought all the drugs were stupid. Like I thought all the dress up stuff was stupid. I, I thought all the, like all the micro celebrity aspect of it was stupid. All the fawning and preening, like hated all of it. And wax right, I would kind share, of be- and everything Steve just said, I would share. That's why yeah. it was so bizarre that I, I just found myself, but I had no idea. I just had no clue what I was getting into. Right, you just knew Al through John Loder and thought, no, oh, this must be okay. No, actually, I just saw, met Al and he was a nice guy, and we did the tracks. Oh, yeah. It sounded good. I, he was perfectly nice. I didn't when I met him. He was a, actually a charming guy. I mean, you know, like when he's not like you charming to me, super nice and kind of, you know, and, and I think he's talented. He's a talented dude. Um, and the but, guy that he worked with, Ion, was his, sort of his partner in crime and ministry. Ion was yeah. was an, 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 a really, really talented guy. And I, I yes. think also a pretty interesting thinker. He had I'd known him from he was in a Seattle sort of art punk band called The Blackouts. And mm-hmm. I really liked The Blackouts. I was a big fan. Yeah. And when they started, they sort of got affiliated with ministry through Al producing a single for them that, that um, and I was like, I had my suspicions of that, of, of, of Al at that point already. And when, and then there was, a, it t- sort of took this kind of odd dark club kind of turn. And I, and uh, I, at that point the blackouts were done and uh, was Rifflin in Al, the blackouts. What's that? Bill Rifflin was, Bill was in, Rifflin the blackouts, in blackouts too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the I can't. I can't remember the third guy's name, but Bill Rieflin, the the drummer, was a, just an astonishing drummer. Really, yeah, really he's an great amazing drummer. drummer. That's mm-hmm. who. That's the right. And he ended up hanging around and being in a bunch of different, being an adjunct drummer for a bunch of different bands. He's now sort of like the the semi permanent or permanent drummer for REM and a bunch of other. He he plays drums for people sort of ad hoc. Um, the session guy. You know, yeah, right. which is guy. a kind of a weird limbo that drummers end up in that I, makes me really sort of pity them, I suppose. It's like, you know, <laughs> you you get really, really good at this thing, and then from then on, you're just sort of called in to, to like, do occasional gigs, you know? <laughs> like, right. I remember a really incredible thing about Rifflin. You know, I got to know them, obviously, because when I went to Chicago, I, mean, I met... When I did the first thing, I only did with Al. And it was just, you know, I only met him for a day or two. Then I mm-hmm. went to Chicago and met Ion and Bill. Um, actually, Bill wasn't there the first time. I, it was uh, Eric from Naked Reagan drummed. Um, but because uh, Bill was out of town. But it was, you know, I really, Ion was great. And it was really interesting to make a song with him. And I, but I, that's when I first realized, oh, these guys are like, there's people involved here who are using a lot of drugs. It was like a different whole other, you know, I just didn't know it in England at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I don't know anything about the. I mean, I've never. I don't know anything about the dance clubs, the club scene. I didn't know. I was, I was completely naive about it. And I. I mean, I could. I could write a fucking book just about my experiences. And suddenly, find myself plunged into it. But mostly, it was so interesting because like I'm so tight with Corey and people like that. And I was like, and I just assumed like not that everyone was like best friend, but I just didn't think like I just didn't. You know, like you, it's like when you like you meet somebody and you you get to town with them and they're like, everyone's like oh yeah, that guy's yeah, watch out. You know, it makes you. So I was just like, wow, what have I got myself involved with here? But on the other hand, Jim and Danny, the guys who ran. Wax track were just amazing, and the people who worked there, I liked them a lot. The people, and it was an interesting time for me to to be involved with that stuff. Um, and then I ended up doing f- four more songs with them, and that session was the one where I, it became very clear that uh, we're just a different, we're totally different people. I mean, it was just a whole mm. other thing. And I mean, one thing I was really struck by by not just a recording session, but also just the label itself was just. The like the um, excessiveness of it, like the amount of money they would spend on on recording, was just seemed outrageous. They would just spend you know days and days and days to do one song, which is completely opposite. You know, I'm the guy who's like, let's make an album in a weekend. You know, if you can, that's that's where I was coming from. So they they were really, and they just were, you know, and they were never sleeping, which suggested they were stimulated <laughs> by something. Right. And, yeah. Um, I hear you. But it was a. And, you know, but since then, you know, I told them, like, when we decided to do the record, I said, like, okay, we can do it, call Palehead, can't put my name anywhere on the cover, I'm not going to be involved with any kind of promotional stuff, and I will never play with you. I said, not, it's like, that's it. <laughs> like, like, that's it. Like, I don't, you know, I'm happy, it was, like, an interesting project, I don't, it's not something that I do, I think you, I mean, there's not, 
I don't think there's any. I don't do cameos ever. Um, and that was a just a weird like it was like a it was a moment like I had been in that band embrace and that broke up and not very pleasantly and then I was starting to play with Joe and I just kind of found myself in this weird little wrinkle of time. I, you know, I quite like that those rec- that record, the Palehead songs. I like them, um, mm-hmm. and I don't, f- I don't, you know, I don't feel like I- I'm actually. I feel kind of. I'm glad that I had that experience, and I'm glad to have gotten to know him. I- I'm glad to get to know him, if only for the f- the fact that when I saw I saw Ministry some years later, a couple years later, and Rithlin was drumming. He was there on tour with him, um, and next to the. The, his drum set he had a music stand on the music stand he had a copy of Moby Dick or something because <laughs> the beats were so <laughs> nothing he was just reading a book every night wow that's... And for that that one fact alone made me happy that I, 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 intera- I interacted with him so anyway that's how like the Jurgensen thing was weird because like people I mean it's funny because that that whole situation did not end well for those guys they all you know they're sure. they sued each other it's like yeah. You know, it got very ugly, and I just. But I mean, I'm just like I'm out. Like nothing to do with me. Yeah, I'm not. You know. The the thing that that seemed so counterintuitive about it was that the thing that differentiated Minor Threat from all of the other hardcore contemporaries were there were two aspects of Minor Threat were that the ferocity was one. It was just like this single minded, like a a pure blast where you you didn't get the impression that it was show business at any point, right? So that was one thing the sort of sincere ferocity and then the other thing was there was a sense of there was like an accomplished execution like none of it seemed slap slapdick at all it seemed, it wasn't like a lot of bands felt like they could get by uh with just good enough and minor threat seemed like they were they were they wanted to be incredible mm-hmm. right and so if you contrast that with this sort of studio piece together like Oh, the kind of music the Wax Tracks bands were doing, which was all about image and uh, effect rather than intensity, right? They like things were done in a kind of a casual, half-assed way, and then kind of shuttled into some sort of a shape that represented uh, a kind of intensity without actually being intense right. to start right. with. So it just seemed like the, like the diametric op. That's what seemed odd about it was that it seemed like, you know, like the things that differentiated Minor Threat from all the other bands were these two things that were literally absent from that scene. You know, well, that's what. That's, and, it, and for an example, like this, I mean, and the point well taken. Like I remember, like a good example of this in my mind is that they were like. We really want to do shows. Won't you perform those songs with us? And I said, I've told you, I'm not. I'm definitely not going to do. It. I mean, there's no way I was going to do it ever. I'm just not going to do it. And they ended up, you know, they had a roadie with a shaved head, and they had him sing the song. <laughs> so they they do Palehead song. And this kid with a shaved head would get on stage and play. And I've had not just once, but numerous times, people tell me that they saw me sing with Palehead. And I said it wasn't me. And one time, I almost got into a fight over it with a guy who was so upset with me for saying that it wasn't with me when he saw you, dude. <laughs> you know, like that guy, you know, like he was so, how do you, he got so upset. How do they know upset. it wasn't Ben Kingsley? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And then uh, actually another time, this couple came up to me and this woman said, you know, this, you know, we're such huge fans, but I always lord over one thing with my, my husband um, that I got to see with Palehead, and he never did. He always that I should I just lord that over him. I said like, well, you can stop now. Yeah, that's because you never saw me with Palehead. And then she was like, what? No, you were there. I said, I, was I guarantee. Look, look, that's the thing. Like those guys had no problem putting up a ball. Like, that they put a long haired dude doing the song. That's fine. But put the bald guy up there. Come on, you know that's just. But I think that's an example of the kind of thing. I just never would have done it. Yeah. Period. And I think they would be happy to do it. So. But I don't know. I don't. I, I really didn't. It's funny, it's like that was a brief moment. Like I knew those guys for like. I knew. You know, I met them like three times or you know four times, and right. I, and I knew them for two years, and then after that, it was all just like them, like this stuff about like, um, like you know when they were suing each other, you know people calling me and said like, do you want to get involved? And I said, no. Do <laughs> you want to get involved in this lawsuit? That's a. Yeah, that's like hey, we're having this. Uh, we're having this. 
um, a divorce, raw beef you know, like salad <laughs> testing tasting. Do you want to do you want to get involved in that? Right. There's one thing I, I should say about the other thing that there's another factor that kind of ties in with the southern thing was that one of the reasons that Jurgensen's why I was interested about his production was that he had been really influenced by Adrian Sherwood, who I was also a huge fan of. And Adrian Sherwood is a dub producer who worked with John. He was like a, a regular at Southern. And I thought he was a really fascinating. Like, I love dub music, and I was fascinated by his work. Did you ever meet Adrian? Yeah, Chief? I met him. He, there was a, a – the the first time I ever spent significant time in, in England was when Big Black went over – on our first tour, we were invited over by Paul Smith from Blast First. Yeah. And he, to his credit, he took us around to see a bunch of record labels because we hadn't decided, like we had to make a decision about who was going to put our records out over there because we didn't have, we'd separated from Homestead and Touch and Go was putting our records out in America, but we didn't have any affiliation overseas. And so we were... In, we were talking to a bunch of different record labels to see who was going to put our records out over there. And Paul Smith ran Blast First, and he introduced us to a bunch of different people, um, basically saying, you know, I want to put your records out, but you might find yourself more aligned with one of these other people. So we met with um, what's-his-face from Rough Trade. Jeff Travis? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and we met with Loader at Southern, and we met with... Um, Daniel Miller at Mute and Mm -hmm. like two or three other people. And um, uh, one one while we were at Southern, uh, we had expressed an interest. We thought it would be interesting to do a record with Adrian Sherwood because his his production aesthetic seemed like nicely abstract relative to a lot of other people at the time. And so we thought it would be cool for Big Black to do a record with Adrian Sherwood. And he came fascinating. (laughs) What's that? That would have been fascinating to hear what he what he would. Well, he was, brought some stuff for us to listen to, and I'll have to say it was like more rock style music that he had worked on, and none of us were that into it. Like it had a kind of a uniformly sort of plastered sound that didn't. What I yeah. the stuff of his that I had liked was the stuff like some of his like dub stuff, which where every song had a fairly radically different presentation you know and what i found disappointing was that sort of as the drugs kicked in his uh, his approach kind of formalized and he was just sort of like overdriving everything and so the production aesthetic sort of boiled down to this like transistorized distortion and saturation with a bunch of reverb on everything and all the stuff that he played us all sounded monolithically the same and not that interesting so that you're, kind of yeah, scuttled that um, it's really but, i have to say you're it's a really it's a really good assessment because i found his like his i met him early on i was actually at the tune for a missing channel um session like that, oh, wow. that which was incredible like i just saw them recording and it was just mind-blowing but the later on, it I just it was just sort of it became less and less interesting. But he was a I think he was a brilliant, he's a revolutionary guy in the studio. Um, he really played the mixing desk desk in a way that was, you know, he he it wasn't like he got everything set and just sat there and watched it. Like when he did it all live, like everything was like yeah. He and he really live. did take to heart the idea that like he did really did in, do an interpretation of the Jamaican dub technique right. where you start with a master tape and then you build a freakish environment from that as raw material right. and that you know that nobody else was doing that people were sort of making feints at it like putting a few effects here and there but he really did i thought he really made some remarkable records and um you know so we were kind of curious if it would be possible to graft our kind of thing where we would like like we were pretty settled and set in our ways about how we wanted to do things and we thought it might be a good idea to disrupt that and in in the end we ended up doing a record with loader instead of right. adrian and that worked out great because yeah that would make a he lot became more. a mentor of mine and he you know he taught me a lot about doing stuff in the studio and i you know i owe a lot of what i've been able to do since to what he taught me and what you know the example that he set so now I'm not sure if you guys shared any stages uh, at any point or when the first time you did work together was, but I know that Ian, your band Fugazi, worked with Steve on early sessions towards 
the Fugazi record and on the Kill Taker. And I'm curious, how did that collaboration actually come about? Um, they called on the phone. Yeah, I mean, Steve, we had, I mean, we got to know Steve. We, every time we go to Chicago, we spent, you know, we saw him there, and we maybe we saw you in England. I remember where did we remember we played football that time. We played with the. We played oh one yeah, game of soccer. That one was game weird. Of it was like the Southern staff versus Fugazi or something like that. But you were there too. Like you were with us. I mean, it was like, yeah, I think I can't remember what I was doing there, but I was there for some reason. It was know. like yeah, there was like they, we played like in Pierre. Remember Pierre, the French dude, and we played, <laughs> yeah. And it was like we had we we just played one half one game of soccer, and one game of American football. And it, was just, <laughs> it was really funny. It was a really it's just like we were just fucking around, but. So we got to know Steve, and we got to know, got to love him. Like spending time out in Chicago, um, and getting to see Steve was always just great, you know. And you know, we always stayed with Corey in Touch and Go. And at that point, I think you know you were pretty much around. You know, you were just there, yeah. and you were sort of the house. It was a very hospitable engine. era. Like people yeah. were always hosting people at their houses, or like if there was, like like people like Ian said he came to Chicago to do the palehead thing or whatever and he probably stayed with jim and danny at wax tracks or he probably yes. or he may have stayed at Corey's place or but i stayed in jim like, and danny and then i went up to Corey's and stayed with him yeah and then like yeah. when i'd go to england whenever i'd go to london for any reason i would stay at southern like it didn't matter what i was doing like i could be going there to work yeah. on a completely unassociated record i would always be invited to crash at southern you know likewise just a, i would stay i would stay at the loader's house for three weeks I'm mean, actually there for. I, mean, I would be there. I mean, I went there many, many times and just by myself. And I would just stay there for weeks on end. And they never. I, they was always. It was. It was a very hospitable time. This. I never stayed in a hotel in London. Yeah, it was really weird for me the first time I actually had to find a place to stay when I went to London. You know, it was after John um, died. It was like, where, where are we going to stay? What are we going to exactly, do now? Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. I'm still thinking about that because now Allison Schnackenberg's out of there too, and I'm like, where yeah. are we going to stay if I ever He's, go back? It, Loder's um, one of those dudes. Like, like you build him into your life as like, well, when we go when we go to London, we're going to deal with John, and then that'll be that, right? And you and it's just becomes like a sort of a standard thing. Like, you build these people into your lives, and then suddenly they're gone, and it's like, holy crap! I I, I have to re- like rebuild my worldview now because this yeah, like true. elemental part is gone. You know. Yeah. So we got to know Steve, and I think we were all really, you know, we were fans um, of each other, like the band and Steve. And at some point, I remember Steve saying. Hey, you know, if you guys ever want to record something, you know, it's on me. This is back when you still at the house, right? Um, right. And uh, so we always had that in our back pocket as a possibility, which was really nice. And we always worked with Don here in Washington, and um, it, you know, we did one record with John Loader, um, and then we did, but everything else we'd ever done ever was with really it was either if not in our own like our own recording, we just did with Inner Ear, uh, Don Zentera. We had spent. Um, in 1992, I guess it was 92. I guess what? Yeah, 92. We spent. Let me think. Is that right? It was in 91. I guess it was 92. We we spent. We had been working away on new songs, and we just kind of hit a wall at some point. You know, with the you know we we kind of yeah we just sort of maxed out. We've been working on these ideas. We couldn't. We just couldn't quite. I don't know, we just need to do something. And I suggested to the band, like, hey, why don't we just get out of town? Let's go to Chicago for a weekend and record two songs with Steve. Let's just go do let's just go do something. Like let's get out of Washington. We're like so deep. We've been working, we have all these songs written, but we're still agonizing over them. We haven't we can't really decide on them. But let's just break out together, the four of us. Uh, and so I called Steve, and he said, "Of course, you know." And we found a weekend that worked. I think it was in November. Um, was it ninety two? I think it was ninety two. Might have been ninety one. That sounds. It might have been ninety one. I, I don't. Was, yeah, no, I honestly I, don't remember. I'm, but it, maybe it was ninety one. Because I do. That's interesting. Well, anyway. Um, so I think it was ninety one. Um, so we went. We. I think I had. I. I rented a minivan. I remember I rented a minivan. And and Brendan had a Volvo station wagon, so we just threw our gear in the back of the two vehicles, and Joe and I drove up in the minivan, and Brendan and Guy drove up uh, in the Volvo, and we went right to Steve's house, um, and uh, we loaded in like on a Friday. I said we're just gonna do two songs, and three days later we had recorded like thirteen songs, and it was the greatest session we ever had. It was the most. Huh. We had a, a blast. Like it was just hanging with Steve and working in the studio. It was just so 
such a pleasure and so enjoyable and so fucking funny. We just, you know, it was like we just laughed and laughed, which is always, you know, for me, it's always, you know, that's just, that's kind of like the essence of of the the creative process is being with people you just can really laugh with. And um, and, and Don Zantera is somebody who, like, you know, like, you know, we just, the guy is, we've had so many yucks in that joint. And um, so the session was just incredible. Like, we had such a great time. Uh, and I still, there's so many, I have so many, like, sort of acute memories of like moments and and things like that um and then you know we drove home I, mean, I think again we had planned on recording two songs i think we recorded and we recorded and mixed 12 or 13 songs um in three days which was crazy you can see the how intensely we were working we were just going around the clock um steve do you have any do you have any insight on that how did it go from a two song session to 13 well, I mean that was kind of that was kind of standard in the day, though. I mean, when a band, you know, if a band had a bunch of stuff to record and a fixed amount of time or fixed amount of money to deal with, like then you you just get it done. You know, I, I mean, I, I think about other records that were done in that same period. Like I did two Silkworm albums, and neither one of them took more than two calendar days. You know, in that same period, you know. And that and that it was just kind of standard for bands to just go into the studio and knock it out and then, you know, sleep when it's over. Right. I think mostly we had just been I think in our mind, we were like, well, let's just do two songs. But mostly because we were thinking we we're just going to hang out and have you know, just see people and record two songs. But it just sounded so fucking incredible. Like it just sounded great. And I think. You know, Steve's like, why don't you do another one? And we're like, you know, do you got another one? Yeah, we'll do another one. And we just kept on, we just kept on doing another one. It was great. Huh. It was just, you know. But, was, but but the sessions you did together didn't end up getting released. No. Because you ended up re-recording and on the Kill Taker with uh, Ted Nicely, right? Uh, well, yeah, Don's. Yeah, we drove. What happened was we were driving. I remember this. So this is like we were, drove, we were driving back from from Chicago. We left like, I remember we had like this last night hanging out with Corey, maybe, and, and Steve and Corey, I think, and. Maybe we went to dinner and maybe we played dice. I don't remember. I think we probably played some Kariki and um Yeah, that makes sense. And then we hit the road around ten o'clock at night to drive back to DC. And so we were we were driving along and um I think you know, we had the two cars, it's in the middle of the night and probably in Ohio or something. I said to Joe, Should we give this thing a spin? And he said, Yeah, let's do it. So I put the cassette in and I just, you know, it just didn't sound right to me. And I and I thought, but, you know, that's not unusual when you're in a session so intensively for days. Like when you come out of it, like the first time you listen to it, it's a little bit like, oh, that's not working. And um, so I, we turned it off and we drove for a while. And then we got to Pennsylvania. You know, it was probably like four in the morning. So let's try again. We, you know, we kind of queued it up and it just didn't sound right. It just didn't sound right. Um, and we got home and unloaded the van and. The next morning, I, I called you know Brendan and Guy, and said, you know, hey, how's your drive? And they said oh, it was great. And we got in at whatever seven o'clock or whatever time we got in, and there was like this long kind of pause. And then uh, I said, so did you, uh, did you listen to the tape? Cause they had their copy of the tape too. <laughs> and I said, uh, why did you? I said, yeah. Did you? And they said, yeah. <laughs> so. And they're like, sound kind of weird. I go, yeah, sound kind of weird. Yeah. And then like a, two days later, a day later, I get a fax from Steve saying like, I think maybe we kind of fumbled on this one. <laughs> but I don't know what, I don't know why, I don't know. I think it just didn't, something just didn't, I don't know what it was. Remember faxes. I mean, Steve, what's your, Steve, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it wasn't my finest hour as an engineer. I think we kind of got lost in the, in the hang and we're enjoying each other's company. And um, uh, I, I probably, you know, in the, in the interest of getting a lot done, I think I was probably, I don't think it was like, I, I guess the easiest way to put it is sometimes you eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you. And I, I think, <laughs> uh, luck of the draw, like we could have, if we had done the set, I mean, it's just as likely that we could have done the session and had it come out awesome. But as it turns out, it came out in a way where we enjoyed everything about it, except the results, you know? I mean, I have to say, I can remember sitting in the attic where the mixing room was, like in the top floor, 
Is that my wrist right? It was up in the E's, right? Wasn't it yeah. up in the top floor? Yeah. And listening to it, we were doing a playback. And I remember thinking, this is the greatest record ever made. <laughs> I mean, it was that kind of like, I was so <laughs> ecstatic and just thinking like, you know, take that Sonic Youth or whatever the, you know, whatever the fuck, whoever was a big band at the time. I was just like really like thinking like this is going to be incredible. And, um, uh, you know, I think that everything, yeah, everything about that session was just great. And I have to say that it was, I mean, it was, it was a very important experience for Fugazi, like the, you know, for the four of us. It was a really to be, you know, um, to, to, you know, to be able to step out of Washington to go, you know, that we didn't do that very often. We just the four of us just go do some work like that and just kind of, and it was something. We're so pragmatic in a way. We just never would go somewhere to record. You know, that right. was that was unusual for us. And I mean, we might go to this house in Connecticut and work on ideas, but that was really like, let's go to Chicago and record. And and we did it, and it was it was amazing. And I think that we really like it solidified. I mean. It certainly helped us work on the songs. I mean, some of the songs we hadn't really finished, and and so we were forced. When you record, you of course you're forced to make an arrangement, um, and and we did. And some of those arrangements, you know, we some of them, most of them stuck. Not that they were all open ended, but you know, there were there were some that were not finished, and some of them we we, we were like, oh, you know what, this yeah, it's not quite right. Mostly, I think we just needed to take more time recording. Right. And if we had spent a week there, it would have been probably would have had a different thing. The other thing is, you know, when you're working with somebody for the first time, and this goes for, you know, I've recorded, I've been in probably hundreds of sessions, but really, I, I there's like three or four times that I've ever worked outside of inner ear. And, what, you know, like with Fugazi, we did it once with Loader and once with Steve. Um, not counting like radio mm -hmm. stuff, but like radio broadcast things. But, and, when you go into that kind of, when you go into a recording session, it's an intimate process, and you have to get to know the people. And there's like, and you know, I remember I remember this so well that I said, you know, I said um, we were recording in Chicago. I said, I said to you um, something like, you know, well, maybe we can make this a little bit, make this a little, a little warmer. And you said, oh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't use that word. I don't believe in that concept. <laughs> I was probably I was a real like, prick what? about it too. Like, <laughs> I mean, it just threw it out. And I was like. I mean, what's, what is there not to believe about it? But you're just so hardcore. Like, I don't, I don't use that word. I don't believe in the concept. And I was like, oh, all right. And I mean, but mostly it's, it's, it's a semantic thing. You know, it's just semantics yeah. and trying to understand. But also, you know, like if nothing else, that whole thing, like the fact that we didn't end up with usable results, like if nothing else, it validated that you guys were doing it the right way in the first place. You know, keeping everything hands on, doing it yourselves. Like stick, sticking with people that already understand you instead of people that had to try to figure you out, you know, like right. So and the resulting actual record is terrific, you know, and you can't really. And if that's the process that it took for you guys to get to that record, I'm fine with it, you know. Also, the other thing about I was going to say another thing about that experience of recording with you, which was so significant for us, is that we didn't we didn't really like people didn't come to our practices. Like we didn't, you know, we weren't like, you know, we didn't perform for people. And, you know, that was like, we, you know, we, that was like, we took our, you know, when you, when you play your song for someone, especially in that kind of setting, you know, that you, we're handing our heart, you know, to that person, like in a way. So like playing and like the kind of, like, like Steve as an engineer, I mean, I mean, Steve's a, a brilliant fellow and, and very, you know, he's, he's got a lacerating wit and. He doesn't. He does not. You know. He doesn't suffer fools. That's for sure. I'm going to put that um, on my business he's card. He's also <laughs> right. He's also like you know a g truly genuinely sweet guy who loves music and is incredibly enthusiastic. And when you work with him and you feel that, it makes you you know you feel like a superhero. Like you just start to and like I think that that was. I mean, if anything, probably we were just like so elated. We were playing these songs. He's like, "This is great." I'm like, "Fuck!" <laughs> this guy is likes our music. We're, I mean, not that he, we didn't think you liked our band, but just like these are new songs. We hadn't really tried them out on anybody. Like you know, some of the stuff we played live, but a lot of it we hadn't, and it was just so exciting. It was a, it was an interesting process, you know, to play to somebody who didn't, you know, you hadn't really done a lot of time with. Um, but also, I think that's probably part of 
why Steve's made so many, you know, so many records and so many important records um, and so many great records um, is that because he he understands that, you know, the engineer slash producer person um, has to ha- have a, has to make an investment, you know, has to also have an, an enthusiasm, has to, to love the fuck out of it. Um, whether or not, you know, people can understand that from afar is like, when you go into the studio, the most important thing as a musician when you're playing is to be like when you finish tracking something that somebody on the other end of the of you know the wire comes through and says great or you know actually who's listening as opposed to I've had a few experiences where I've been recording and then you know it, you know you clicks into the, the control room and no one says anything and that's a terrible feeling like and you go like well how was that and you're like uh. I mean that's what the, that's what band you know, that's what bands do you know that's what bands do to each other. But it's important to have somebody as a referee, somebody who actually has like you know has also is interested in the project and isn't just sort of like are you are you happy with that or not? I mean Steve, he pushed us hard and we and we fucking went hard. I mean we listen to some of you listen to recordings. You can like I mean Guy and I are just singing so hard. We're just, just like, going really went hard on that thing because we were. You know, we wanted to we wanted to knock it out of the park, and we really did. We put it right out of the park. Well, my the 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 only like my two cents about that recording session were like the best thing about it for me was that it we got to hang like we got to hang out the whole band got to hang out for a while and we got to know each other and got and realized that we were actually friends instead of just people that sort of knew each other and sort of admired each other, and then uh, we then then we had excuses to hang out again when shellac played with fugazi a number of times and that was always terrific like every time it was a blast you know mm-hmm. we we did some tra- we traveled in australia with them and we played some shows over in england with them and uh, we hosted them in chicago and it was just every time it was just just like it was like hanging with family it was really really great and so that that was the beginning of that sort of relationship which w- that's the thing that i take out of it and then also, I think what Ian was saying was like, um, I, as a fan, I was kind of, you know, getting into it a bit much during the session. And I think my bedside manner has changed. And that might have been one of the things that changed it was realizing that me being into it doesn't necessarily make for better results. And I've gotten an awful lot more cold blooded about my uh what i what i will allow music to affect me how much i will allow the music to affect me in the studio and i think i've i think results have gotten better as a result in a way i feel like i'm slightly cheating myself from the fan experience during the session (laughs) but uh it definitely impinges on my like my critical facilities and my like attention span like if i'm allowing if i allow myself to like get stoked about what's going on then i'm dropping the ball technically more times than not so i I definitely sort of take a cold shower in the studio now whereas (laughs) at that point i was probably still you know humping everything you know (laughs) right right i can dig that i mean especially i think is a i think i mean i've i've never been an engineer exactly i mean i've done some attempts at engineering but um i'm usually sort of the fifth, like I'm like the fifth member of the band, or the mm-hmm. you know whatever the the extra person, the producer seat, and so I think that role. I think in in your case, like you know, you're the engineer and you're the producer, so you had sort of a, a dual. I think you're right. The engineer kind of has to be more like kind of has to be cold blooded. And even the I guess even to some degree, I think the the person producing it has to be. But I think it's also I feel like it's important to have some investment. Otherwise, it just becomes like a I don't know. It just seems like you would lose. You would just lose touch, but of course, you're, that's your job. I mean, you have to do that all the time. And I imagine that there's. I, mean, I remember talking to somebody who worked in a studio, and he was really. He said he, he had a small studio, but it was getting popular, and he said he couldn't stand some of the bands there. He just didn't like their music. And I said, "Well, too bad, you know." Right. <laughs> like he's, yeah, that's what the money's for. Them. Right. That's right. Like you're, they're, they're, you know, you're. It's not like they're, they're. It's not a reflection on you, like the fact that they, their music is like you don't think their music is cool or something. It's like you're supposed to help them arrive 
at what it is they're trying to get to. And yeah, that's been that's, your job. that's that's been that was like a a real sore point for me. Like what I mean, you remember what it was like trying to get into a studio when you had no money in the early '80s, for example. Like you're going through the yellow pages trying to find a studio that would let you in and trying to find one that would tell you what their prices were and trying to find, you know, of those, right. trying to find the cheapest one. And then you finally get into the studio and then and the engineer, like, tells your guitar player he can't turn his amp up that loud, that kind of stuff. Like, that's, Right, no distortion, yeah. That crap happened all the time yeah. to bands that, right. like, of our generation before there were sympathetic studios, mm-hmm. you know. And, mm-hmm. it, you know, so I, I had sort of internally committed to not being that guy like if a guy sh- if a band showed up with some fucked up setup or from some something that i didn't get my initial response shouldn't be that you got your band is wrong and you should change that my initial response should be i have to figure out how to deal with that rather than you know expecting the band to conform to my expectations right. so that that was informed by all of that, you know, and and I kind of, and it sort of extended that, and I've made a logical connection in my head. Like, it really isn't my place to like or not like the music that I'm working on. When I'm in the, working in the studio, it's like, it's literally none of my business what kind of record the band want to make. And if I start forming opinions, that's the first step toward treating some of those bands less with less of my attention than others, you know, because you just can't, Mm -hmm. if you, if you like band A and you don't like band B, then band B are not going to get a fair shake, you know, and that's not, that's not, I don't, I just don't, don't like that as a perspective. So I've, I've kind of, I've kind of like emotionally deadened myself in the studio. (laughs) And uh, one other thing that I took from that session was Ian taught me a trick that I have used countless times since then. There's a thing like when people are self-conscious about their vocal, they often want to double their vocals, right? And people who are not self-conscious about it, about their vocals, will sometimes double their vocals for effect, for a very specific effect. And either way, like the conventional technique is to listen to the lead vocal and sing along with it, right? Ian showed me this thing that he did when he wanted to double his vocal, which is he would memorize the cadence of his singing and then sing the second vocal layer without listening to the first one so that his each a vocal delivery was independent and rather than and there's a thing there where if you're not listening to something while you're singing then your tuning is more the tuning of your voice is more confident uh, the delivery is more confident. Everything about it is more sort of solid because it's a, it's sort of standing on its own as far as the performance is concerned. And then when you play the two back together, instead of having a lead vocal and a slightly out of tune, slightly timid doubling vocal, you have these two very strong, very bold, very in tune vocal performances that sound much better together doubled. So I'd never, I had never tried doubling vocals that way, and Ian showed me how to do that, and so, and I've, I've suggested that to to bands a hundred times since then. Well, hundred is an understatement. Mid- so thank you, and you say you're not an engineer. <laughs> well, the thing about me as a singer, I when I try to double my voice, if I heard my original vocal in there, um, I would always, I'd always key off of it i just i i try to like weird do the weird almost like i started to harmonize or something to it in a way that just was not um i just couldn't do it i'd always go out of key and i'm i'm really my phrasing generally like the stuff i'd want to double usually the phrasing is like it is set in stone for me i just the way i am my time like i don't need to hear myself in my head i know exactly where the vocal is going to go um but also i do think that people like i find double vocals most people, as you as Steve said, most people are like they're more comfortable. They don't they they feel less naked. Um, but I think that when you double vocals, it's it's another it's another form of processing, and it ultimately takes like the soul out of the out of the recording. And a lot of like you know, I think the the greatest punk records, the greatest records, is just when you have the single voice. And I oh, know the, yeah. the singer themselves may may. They may be struggling. They may struggle with that. But I always say just like 
tough shit. They just, you know, sing. And then if you want to have like, you know, there's a couple moments where I'm like, I want to double this one phrase because actually you want to just make it really like trumpets almost or something. Like that's, that's how I was looking at it. It's like, it's like trumpets and, and um, really, you know, I mean, uh, an example of that would be, um, they, I always think about it. I was like, there's a, um, the song, No Reason by Meyer Threat, which, you know, the chorus is doubled and, that was really, it's like a, if you, if you, you know, you listen to it, it's really almost like there's like a, 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 an array of trumpets blowing. That's the idea in my mind, like to have it really pro, like powerful and, and sticking out that way. Um, so there's, there's definitely been a lot of like, like over the years, just from, I have a lot of experience in the studio as a, as a musician and also as a producer. I was thinking about this actually this morning, oddly, I was not sleeping at like 4.30 in the morning and. I got to thinking about I was trying to think of like how many sessions I've been in or how many bands I've produced. And I realized I have no record of that, like other than the actual records. But I mean, I did more. I just don't have any idea. And I was, and I think that very few people have any sense of the amount of time I did in the studio, you know. And over the years, I think that people think of me like, well, he's the guy that does the record label or he's the guy who's in the band or whatever. But um, I used to, I loved producing bands when I was doing it. I haven't done it in, in years, mostly because I just, I think that my relationship, people's relationship with me has changed. They, not people want me to re, to record them because my name would look, you know, it brings a certain. It's my name they want. Um, whereas before, I was just recording with people who are my friends who just wanted somebody to referee, or to kind of give them like an outside perspective on it. Um, and also because again, I love being in the submarine. Like I mm-hmm. love that. I love being in the submarine, just locked in with some people and trying to figure out how to get back to the surface. Um, I was going to say that Steve's point about recording, the first recording session I ever w- did was when I was in this band, the Teen Idols. And we went to a small studio outside of Washington and the uh, the engineer completely ridiculed us, like just just made fun of our songs in a way and wouldn't let us, made us turn down the distortion and totally like didn't, wouldn't, this, the way he recorded it was just, he put he printed reverb all over everything. In other words, it was like to tape. He put the reverb on the tape, and 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 at one point there was once we did two sessions with him. And I remember one session, you know, he had, it was in his basement, but he had cut in a, a window between the control room and the live room. And while we were tracking, another band had come in to look at the studio, and he was pointing at us, and they were all laughing while we were tracking a song, <laughs> and it was just horrible it really it was so horrible and it made me just hate it's like it's like music shops like music store you go to a music store how much how would fucking assholes those people were like when you go to a music store and they'd say things like what do you have a band and you're like fuck you like i'm i'm purchasing from you i don't need to be like have you by your, have you ever heard um, uh terry's terry from the x's story about how he bought his guitar no um Terry was invited to be in this punk band. He'd never played guitar before, and he didn't have a guitar. Mm. And uh, so he went to the guitar shop, and he said, do you have any guitars for left-handed people? And wow. uh, and the guy said, well, I, uh, let me look at the, and you can look in the catalog here. We, we can get you one of these. And w- the first thing the guy pointed to Terry said, "Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and get that guitar for me." <laughs> and he never, never played a note. Didn't even really know what it was. And then he came back after the guitar had had arrived. Like he came back, and the guy said, "Yeah, yeah. Do you want to plug it in and play it?" And and he was like, "No, no, that's fine. I'll, uh, this, I'm sure this is fine." And he just left with it. He didn't want to. Pl- he didn't want to have to <laughs> plug the guitar in without knowing how to play it in front of anybody. And then the band started, and he, they went and played a show. I mean, that's, I have to say that having I just had those guys here for the last couple of days, and I just saw them play the other night, and it's so like it's so Terry that story, because yeah. <laughs> he plays like no other person, you know. He's just. Um, um, but to follow on my point, though, is that we finally were invited, like by this friend of ours, Skip Groff. He said, "You know, I know another studio. This guy Don Zentera, and you know, do you want to go with me? And we thought, well, maybe Skip, who he had a record store here, and he had he had done some recording with people and had put out a few records, and uh, it was a, very, a hugely important 
figure in our scene, like an older guy that really like took a lot of us under his wing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he took us to this, to the studio in Virginia. Um, and uh, I mean, we went in really defensive, having basically been traumatized and abused by this other place. But Don never he Don said, well, "What do you just set up what you want to sound?" And he, as an engineer, I mean, really, what he was about was trying to help bands like sound like the way they wanted to sound. And it was an incredible, like, it was revelatory for me to to meet somebody like that. And I've worked with him for 35 years since then. Like, I still, I was with, I was in the studio with him last week, you know, just doing some, just, you know, getting some, uh, just getting old tapes sorted out. But, mm-hmm. um, but you know, a really deep relationship came from that. But really, it was a profound thing to meet somebody who was like, let's get what you want to sound like. You know, let's figure out your... He never he didn't try to change a wit of us, you know, and and he, his job was was to do as good a recording as possible. And, you know, he was super, you know, he had a handmade that he had built his own board. It was a four track studio. But those tapes still sound great. Like they still like his recordings are great. And it was, you know, really an incredible experience. And, and actually in that first session. And this will kind of give you like the a sense of Don's and Tara that, you know, Skip had said to me, like, well, if you guys, what do you want to do with these tapes? And we said, well, you don't know. Like, we don't know. We're just recording. We have no idea. And I said, yeah, I mean, it's not like, you know, no one's going to put it out. And he's like, well, maybe a label would. And there was a label here called Round Raul Records. I, I had no idea who it was. <laughs> Round were. Raul. And I just, yeah. So I just said, um, I just, you know, because I'm a fucking loud mouth, I just said, like, it's not like those fucking assholes at Round Raul were going to put this thing out, even though I didn't know who they were. But it turned out that Don was Round Raul. <laughs> and I'm like sitting in this little control room with him. And Don, and Skip said, well, they're Don, that's his label. And I'm like, oh, well, I mean, well, I said, you know, well, I mean, no offense. <laughs> but Don didn't take any offense because that's Don. He didn't, he just laughed. He just said like, I mean, he knew that I, he knew that I didn't know what, what the hell I was talking about, but he and he got the spirit of it yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, and you know, that so I think that that meeting that like, he was one of the first, you know, probably one of the earliest studios where really he just was open. He's an art guy. He just wants people to get what they want, and he you know he's professional as hell and super knowledgeable, but so unorthodox that like, the gear he has still is just so weird compared to other studios and. He just doesn't care. Don does not give a fuck, and I love right. that about him. He's a. Have you met Don before, Steve? Yeah, I've, I think I've only met him once, though. He's a really he's an uncanny guy, you know, and he's just somebody. And I've met a couple other studio guys over the years who remind me of him. But he's a really he's a really he's an interesting guy, and his studio still just goes on and on and on. Even though people have said like you know if you don't make this move technically techn- technological move. Like your your studio's over, and yet he just keeps right. on going. Yeah, I found that people with advice like that typically themselves are not running a successful studio. So I, you can ignore the, that kind of advice, right. you know. Exactly. And, all, and over the years, everybody, every studio that has jumped at all the latest technological changes, like they they've invested in in this one specific moment in history and then of course as technology changes that that investment then is wasted right so the studios that have survived right. are the ones that have either had minimal investment so they're very sort of quick on their feet to adapt or they're in, they've invested in a specific like core technology and then just decided that they're going to stick with it. And that's, you know, that's the model that we've opted for. Now, Steve, I don't know if this is fair to direct to you, but do you have any knowledge of how the kill taker sessions that you worked on began circulating publicly? I don't know. No, but um, the way that typically happens is that somebody is, you know, a friend or, or someone affiliated with the band uh, you know, has a copy, and then uh, you know someone else will sort of blag a copy. Uh, you know, with the caveat that of course I'd never share it with anybody. Right. And then they share it with someone else who says, "Oh, you know, of course I would never share it with anybody." <laughs> and eventually, it gets to somebody who's more than happy to share it with <laughs> with everybody. So, 
Or they just don't even know. They don't even know they're not supposed yeah, to share. Yeah, by the time it gets three or four bounces away, you know, the whatever promises were made initially don't don't really hold any sway. Right. I know. I never. I don't even well, think really I have deep a copy of it. it. I've never given. I've never. I don't. Yeah. I I think I had a copy of it at the time, um, just for listening purposes. But I wouldn't have any any idea how to find it now. So. Okay. And I would say, and I would say that and I would say that like there are also in other ways that quite often like people in the studio who have other engineers or whoever people may have access say like oh you should check you know do you want to hear that and then you know that's I mean one of the problems is once it went I mean if it's a cassette it's a little bit of a different thing but once it got into the digital realm it doesn't people just can just knock stuff off in a heartbeat when I mean, we were so we buried that fucking thing like i remember i had sent one copy to our roadie <laughs> this guy mark oh. sullivan i gave him a copy and then he had sent it to his brother in boston and i called his brother and said send me the tape back and did you give any copy wow. and he oh, sent wow. the tape back that's how hardcore we went about it because we were like we gotta they, we just gotta deep six it but it's weird like i don't i mean it's interesting i have no idea and it, but it's impossible entirely possible that he made a copy of it so who knows and, and maybe over the years like mm-hmm. brendan or somebody i have no <laughs> idea like you know i'm just curious i'm just curious because it does circulate and, and the i mean there's another another aspect of it is that like you've seen all the like the famous session multi-tracks that make their way out onto the yeah. into the internet and not, an awful lot of that comes from someone at a record label or someone who has control of a master will turn it over to a third party and say, uh, okay, we need a, I want to make a, a safety copy of this. So can you make me a safety copy of right. it? And then while that person is making a safety copy of it, they make one for themselves as well. Mm-hmm. And then, then it starts right. that daisy chain of like, well, I can let you hear it. I can let, make you a copy, but you can't give it to anybody. And then, you know, three bounces later, everybody has it. Right. You know? Okay. No. Let's just blame Bob Weston. Let's just blame Bob <laughs> Weston for this. I had the good fortune of attending the independent arts festivals that took place in Chicago in 1998 and 2001 with uh, Fugazi and Shellac and Blonde Redhead the first time. And then the next time we were just talking about the X and the X played. And it was mind blowing. And Steve, I was just curious, is that or was that, that a recurring blowing. festival in Chicago? No, it was just that was a that was a sort of an umbrella name that we would use whenever Shellac and Fugazi would do a show together. He, my wife Heather was principally involved in organizing a lot of those shows. We did one of them ended up the the first one was the one at the roller rink, and then after that we uh, typically do it at like the Congress Congress Theater. Yeah, yeah, Congress Theater or and the the Congress Theater had like a big lobby and an atrium and so there was a lot of extra room and so um it was heather's idea to like get more people involved than just the bands and turn it into kind of an event and so there was ended up being sort of exhibition space or people would set up tables and like have like the record labels would have their stuff or screen printers would have their stuff or kids with a fanzine would have their a little table that kind of thing right okay heather's heather was a total She's a brilliant visionary. And, like, when we do, like, she's one of my favorite people to work with. So, when, like, she would just have these ideas and, like, well, we have this giant, like, f- you know, foyer, like, at this theater, and we can just fill. I said, okay. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, I was always amazed the stuff she could pull off. And there was, it really was, there was, right, and they're big shows. I mean, it was like, I don't know, it's yeah. how big is that room? Two or three thousand? I have no idea. A couple thousand, yeah. Yeah, but it was, you know, they're, they're big shows, and um, I've always felt really, they're just perfect, perfect productions, really. Well, they're deeply and meaningful to me as a fan, if that matters to you. I remember corresponding with Heather for tickets from Canada, uh, just trying and to... one thing about go. her, another thing is at the end of the day, she'd always say, I don't want any money at all. And I'd be like, okay, you know, fuck that. You know, you got to take something because she would work so hard. But she's so just committed. She just, thought, she just wanted to make something good, and she did. And these beautiful... Yeah. I have these beautiful, I guess they're J. Ryan prints, uh, the the posters. Yeah. yeah. I have them from both yeah. shows. Yeah, I look at them every day. Yeah, it's... It, those were really um, – I didn't realize there were three of them. I didn't know about the roller rink thing because the Congress Theater also – I understand it's basically a condemned building now or something. It's been through a change in ownership. and I mean it was – that that block was owned by somebody and then it was bought by somebody else and like the neighborhood 
was kind of not into that owner. And that, like there's a whole bunch of political stuff associated with that block. Hmm. And I I have stayed out of it. I don't have anything to do with it. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, those shows were remarkable. I just wondered how they came about. The first one, the roller rink, was it, it was us, you, and... the And Spiv's band with the makeup. Was it Ulysses or makeup? It was makeup. Was Ulysses. Was it makeup? Okay. Yeah. And that, and that, and that room, wasn't that... That was a kind of a famous. It was a it, at the time it was called the Rainbow Roller Rink, but previously it had been um, the Electric Playground or Electric something um, that was a sort of a psychedelic club, psychedelic. And era you could still rock look at the club. hall, the wreckage of the hall, right? You could see the wreckage of the hall. Like you, not, it was not the roller rink, but if you kind of go up, you could see. I, I'm remembering and it was like another. Previously, room. it had been a speakeasy, yeah, yeah. and so they right. still had all of that architecture from when it was a speakeasy was all still there hmm. yeah bernie the fan was a big part of that gig too he was involved with that yeah bernie um he was involved in a bunch of like setting up a bunch of yeah. shows back in the day i don't think he's done anything i think he got involved in boxing promoting <laughs> wow. wow yeah i don't even know why i think that i have god knows i haven't seen or heard from him in years i have no idea i don't remember the last time i heard from him. 20 years 15 hmm. years no idea. I want to ask you guys about your role. I mean, people often look to both of you for advice and opinions about all manners of things, that I imagine. And I wonder what drew each of you to not only engage with independent culture, but then actually take on these leadership roles as well. Um, Ian, can you speak to that? I guess the first thing I, do, I don't think about is a leadership role. Yeah, I think that I that's kind of a that, weird phrasing. Yeah, I would never think like that. I would just, just not the, I mean, I think that as a punk, I mean, I come out of punk rock, and part of that was sort of like just speaking your mind and being and 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 um, so from very you know from the very beginning, I always thought you just supposed to talk about the you know how you see things. And as a lyricist, certainly that was my that's my my intent. And I think over the years, when one is interviewed a lot, one develops like sort of a kind of a a power a perceptive power or something you just get this you start to think about things in a from an external way and maybe that has something to do with it. i don't know i mean i've been interviewed thousands of times um and i know steve has certainly done many interviews and there, i have to say steve's interviews are you know they, they're they're always great i think i always enjoy you know they're good interviews because he's fucking thinking about it and he's not scared to speak they like, say what's on his mind you know like that's and i think that's always very refreshing um i agree so i think that you're confusing um confidence with leadership and i think that to be confident in, in your own word people may perceive that like if you're if you're somebody and you just go you start walking people you might say well that guy's leading or he or she's leading um but really that person is walking and other people might feel like they're 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 behind them, but they're not necessarily. They're just, they're just showing that it can be walked. You you see that they can they're showing that you can that the path can be made. Right. That's all. Sure. And I think that you know from my point of view, a lot of the you know what I'm interested in is not people lining up behind me. What I'm interested in is people feeling like that they can they also can carve their own paths. I'm shocked by um, how um, ineffective people feel uh, in a world that is so rife for change you know i find it shocking so um so i think that when i am interviewed if someone's gonna ask me a question i damn well intend to fucking answer it and um and i think that that kind of uh leaning into it in the way i do probably gives you know that's just con again it's just confidence i don't mean but i also i hope you'll notice if you look at my interviews i very rarely like i'm very careful about i don't talk shit about people you know i don't this is my nature. Guys don't want what, to get what, into wait, that. What's that about? <laughs> yeah, it's just my way. I just don't. I don't want to get into like having. I don't want. I'm not interested in getting into some like tit for tat. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm mostly like if, to me. I'm just. A, it's a like construction work, and not you know. And I don't. I mean, I, there are plenty. I enjoy like as I said. Like I enjoy reading Steve's. Like recently, I forget. I just came across. Um, I don't know what were you? Who were you wrangling with the other day? You. Or not the other day, it was last month or two months ago, but it was pretty amazing. You critique something. It was something about the music union. It was thing Mark it was Mark was Ribot. It? And Yeah, it was yeah. an incredible exchange. And I thought that I really, really appreciated your thoughts on that. And and um you know, and it's the kind of thing that like I'm not in the social media world, but every once in a while shit will something will happen and someone will send me and go, You have to read this. <laughs> 
And I love, those are the things I always think are the ones that are worth reading because someone actually plucked it out of the aquarium. Yeah, it's kind of curated. And on, yeah. If they pulled it out of the aquarium and put it on my desk, I'm like, all right, like right on. Um, and that was a really interesting exchange. But from my point of view, like I stay away from like proper nouns for the most part, like unless I'm just telling a story about something. But I just try to stay out of giving people shit because I don't want to, I'm just not interested in having to hear them like respond that way. I don't give a fuck about it. Mm. It just seems pointless. But I also, like, I try not to talk too much about, like, if you look at my interview, I rarely do I talk about, like, say, like, well, I don't think people should do this. Or I don't think, you know, I'll say what I do to some yeah. degree. But there's a lot of things. People ask me about my personal life or my, or things that, and I don't, you know, people, like, want to ask me about my diet and shit like that. And I don't, I generally don't discuss that because I'm not, I'm not trying to um, give people a blueprint. I'm trying to give people a fucking pen so they can make their mm. own. Steve, what about you? Well, I mean, it's it's odd that you would use terms like leader to speaking to people like Ian and I, who basically don't recognize that those kind of hierarchies. Sure, sure. You know, um, I I think a better term would be like examples, like the way Ian has conducted himself and. The way the people that, you know, like we were just talking about, we had been talking about John Loder and the other people that were inspirational to us. The the way people conduct themselves uh, gives you uh, an idea that things are possible, you know. And if I'm that for somebody else, that's fine. But I recognize that there are those people for me. And in a lot of cases, what I'm talking about is stuff that I've learned from the way other people have behaved that has informed the way I can behave, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't really feel like it's on me to square anybody else up, but I do think that there are, I'm not afraid to draw conclusions, and I'm also not afraid to point things out, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I, I'm comfortable speaking as an authority. What I, what I can do is I can make observations or that I, I can, you know, uh, highlight something. But it, it, it's like I said, I mean, I don't think either Ian or I would recognize the notion of an authority in any of these matters. Like it's just – it can be done in a way that you feel comfortable – things that can be done in a way that you're comfortable with or a way that you're uncomfortable with. And you can – if you do them in a way that you're comfortable, then that – you know, provides an option for people who maybe didn't think that was an mm -hmm. option. Mm -hmm. And what about Ian's distinction of not talking shit about people or necessarily calling people out? <laughs> uh, well, there, are, my, I I try to keep that in a place where if if someone has taken it on himself to like present either an opinion or a position or an argument and one of those and, and there's something fundamentally wrong about that I think not challenging that position or that argument is irresponsible mm -hmm. if, if, if you're in a position to do it right um, on the other on the other hand uh, it's also just gratifying to recognize stuff that you think is awful as awful, uh, if only because it you know you're you're you don't feel like a sucker. You don't feel like you're just buying into whatever crap anybody is thrown out there. And I, you know I, one of the things that kind of was a pet peeve during the hardcore era was this thing that was sort of embodied by zines like Maximum Rock and Roll and a lot of individual people, which was to never speak ill of another punk, you know? Right. Uh, and that, to me, seemed to sort of indicate that we, that we weren't capable of critical thought and that we weren't, that, uh, we weren't willing to acknowledge, that, acknowledge it when somebody blew it. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I always felt that that was a critical aspect of the punk scene was that you couldn't get away with half-assing it. You know, at least in Chicago, that was very specific, very, very, very 
significant part of the scene here was people holding each other to account for being jagoffs about something or being too big for their britches or whatever. And uh, and I always and that sort of because I sort of came of age in the music scene here that informed my perspective on on how you deal with basically everything is like to not let people pull one over on you not and not buy anybody's bullshit just because they said it you know you hold you you hold people to a higher standard than that i think yeah you're i think you're talking a little bit about social diplomacy or something and i mean in your lifetimes in your public work you've each had an interesting relationship with the notion of political correctness and i'm curious how you relate to this concept these days like steve what do you think of that well i i have to admit that my it's been an evolution for me like the the term political correctness came about when the left, the sort of radical left, uh, recognized that there was developing this very stilted speech where people were using gender-neutral pronouns or using he, she for everything. People were avoiding – you trying to be inclusive about every, about every statement, trying not to, like, assume any sort of roles or stereotypes. And it – really stifled conversation. It made it really difficult to have people uh, regular conversations. And, and as a point of critique within the left, whenever anybody would use one of the prohibited p- pronouns or say something that was judgmental, somebody else would kind of chide them and say, you know, that's not PC. Right. right? And that was – but that was with an air of like awareness that – those things were trivial and not that wasn't you know it was kind of it was kind of a lighthearted point of critique within the left that the left was getting too hidebound in its language right and the term political correctness has now been adopted as a weapon by the right and by the conservative elements of culture as a way to henpeck anyone who expects other people to behave decently toward each other, toward toward the rest of the world, mm-hmm. and so the term political correctness has now become uh, a, an arguing point for the conservative side of the spectrum. As a po- and it, it, it was co-opted from the left. So my and I would argue that it's not it's not a recent development. Reagan was really the first to hammer down the idea that being politically correct was somehow, I mean, you think about the English language, those two words, you know, politically correct, you know, if you take it on a face value, it's correct. But somehow the, you know, Reagan revolution managed to invert that into something, uh, you know, it was, it was a derisive term and, you know, a pejorative. Uh, and also, like, you know, to care was selfish, you know, right. that kind of thing, you know, like to be concerned is, you know, like to be concerned was, you know, you're trying to destroy jobs or you know, whatever, whatever it was. Like, it was just like this new speak kind of like inversion right. of, of, of meaning. So and I think if that, you, that... If you substitute... Yeah. The, uh, the friend of mine posted this on Facebook, and it's as stupid as it is to, for me to have to admit it, admit that, but um, that this actually makes perfect sense. If you substitute the phrase being decent toward other people for the term political correctness in every instance, then you start to see how ridiculous the arguments against political correctness as, a, as an ideology Absolutely, are. Absolutely, yeah. Like, when someone is offended by political correctness, what they mean is they, they don't want their biases and their presumptions to be criticized. They want to be able to get away with them and not have anybody call them on them. And it's I think it's healthy to be called on those biases and presumptions. And if anything, if nothing else, it gives you gives the person who's been called on them an opportunity to justify their biases and their presumptions. And uh, and it identifies aspects of normal interaction that might that have buried within them layers of condescension and and uh, bias and criticism and prejudice that would have been unspoken otherwise. And while it might be irritating for somebody to pipe up now and again, I would much rather have that dialogue. And and risk offending someone who's being callous. I would much rather have that happen than you know carry on 
the way things have been with all of these all this sort of institutional and casual racism and sexism and homophobia and all that we have all of that stuff just simmering unspoken i would i would rather have it pointed out now and again no that doesn't mean that you have to, it has to be kowtowed to, to at every point you know and you know what's funny is funny and the mind wanders where it wanders and sometimes it wanders into places that are not you know polite or uh, appropriate for all audiences but right, right and i don't think any of that can be denied but i also don't think that it's a bad idea every now and again to be reminded that it's you know it's not it's not evil to wish that people were more civil toward each other there's nothing there's nothing inherently wrong with that Ian, you actually incorporated political correctness or whatever, I suppose, in, in, in the lyric, in, in the same. And I'm just curious how, how your relationship with that concept has evolved. I mean, well, I mean, I, I, it was and it is the same, which is, as I said, you know, I felt like there was, I mean, the reason I put that line in the song was because there was already a point in time where people were, like, you know, accusing. There was a point in, like, in early punk for me, like, people sang what they saw or what they felt about, you know, what they thought. And then at some point people were like, you know, where there was this sea change in lyric writing. And if you wrote something about, like, you know, that you were concerned about something, then people say, well, you're just being politically correct and you're critiqued for that. Um, so I just put it out there. Like, yes, I know. Yes, I know this is politically correct. Um, and I don't mind, like, from my point of view, like, I, I just straight up was saying, you know, I'm, I could give a fuck whether people think I'm politically correct or not. Um, I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to soften my attack or my position on things so as not to make other people uncomfortable that I'm not interested in, in terms of my singing, um, I think, or my lyric writing in terms of, I think what's interesting about political correctness and what was stifling the conversation that Steve was talking about in my mind, really, it was a nonpartisan issue. It wasn't really left or right. It's just, it's like, it's people who are trying to, um, derail, progression in a way or evolution because they're worried that they're not on the train or something. I mean, a lot of times I'd be in these sort of quasi-collective sort of settings where people are talking about something and then one person or a couple of people were constantly like deriding people, other people for using certain terminology or not, or, you know, not handing the talking stick to someone or whatever it was. I just, you know, there's always <laughs> something, but really I felt like those people, they are just future real estate agents. Right. They did not. They were not. They're hung up on they're, protocol. They're tourists. They're like because they're all they're interested in doing is like they didn't want the conversation to progress. They wanted to keep the conversation. They wanted to point out that people weren't talking in a way that they thought by whatever rule book they were using um, was not agreeable. Um, then there's other people in my life who point out, you know, I would use term terminology um, mindlessly by habit. And uh, people who gave a damn, you know, about things would say, by the way, you know, you use this term in a way that maybe you're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated that kind of political correctness, if that's what it was. I think it was really important. I learned a fuck of a lot from other people giving a damn and saying stuff. It wasn't they weren't trying to shut me down. They were trying to open me up. It's just a different kind of um, thing. And I think that political correctness you know, I, I'd already seen, you know, really Reagan, the Reagan revolution was a very successful. It really, you know, greed was good, you know, or charity or charity was selfish. Greed was good. You know, everything was inverted. And this is something that it, it was and still is really clear. Like I'm, I mean, I think, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., which is a democratic stronghold. Like, you know, the democratic party, which is, you know, I mean, they're not very left, but they're leftish and um, uh, not leftist, but leftish. And, uh, you know, I wasn't it wasn't until I was I, th I think I was 18 years old when I first met my first Republican. Like I just never I just never I just assumed they were like I, don't, I have no idea what to make of them. Mm. But when I met him, I was shocked. It was like, as if it was like two different worlds where some of these people I talked to, I, I was stunned by people who are on the right because I feel like it's like a totally different like they're looking at things in a way that I just don't understand I don't think that most by the way I don't think most right wing Republican or right wing people I don't think that they are uh, 
incapable of caring or anything like that. But I think that the 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 way that they get played, like the base is really it's interesting. The Republicans have no trouble going radical right, but the Democrat part Democratic Party really struggles with going radical left. Yeah. You know, you have your occasional Nader or Sanders, but like I think they're terrified of I mean, I think the Americans are so terrified of socialism that but because it's probably the better idea, but that's you know for whatever it's what it's worth. But um, so I think that uh, I think over the years, um, again, I just decide when people say shit. I mean, I've been told by really like righteous kind of leftist people that you know they will critique maybe some of my lyrics, some of the songs I've written, and they'll tell me that I don't have a right to sing those particular songs for whatever their reasons are. And my response, of course, is fuck you. Like I, you know, I'm fucking, I'm a punk, and I sing whatever I want to sing about. I'm gonna write. I'm a human being. I get to write whatever I want to write about. So I was always really stunned by this. Like when I would run into this sort of things, and it's one of the reasons that like I am, I'm an informal collectivist. Like if people want to work together and make something great, but I am not gonna fucking join. A, you know, a situ, get involved with a situation where, you know, you you can't. You can't get past the reading of the minutes because there's so much structure yeah. in place. It just doesn't fit for me. I think that that, and that makes sense if you think about my trajectory anyway. Like I you know I never went to college. I never like I just started a record label. I didn't know how to make a record label. Like we just made records. We didn't know there was a science to it. We thought record labels made records. You know, if you're a band, you make music. I remember I had the first interview I ever did when I was in the Teen Idols. The woman who was interviewing us said, "Are you in?" Did you join a band for the girls or the money? Right, right. And right. I was stunned because it never, ever occurred to me that it's that would be odd a reason. How that, I, it, it, when you hear these like tropes about you know people join bands to be popular or to get girls or get money and and or make money and like I, I've known musicians. I've been around musicians my entire life. I, since I was a teenager, I've always been in the company of people in bands. And I, I, I mean, apart from a few people during the sort of feeding frenzy of the of the 90s, I can't think of anybody who would genuinely espouse that as, as an opinion, like that they got into a band for one of those two reasons. Like those two reasons seem to be like the, the furthest thing from your mind, you know. You get in, right. You're in a band because being in a band is awesome. That's yeah, that because you're because you're a musician and you have to make music. That's that's I thought what we were doing. So I think that my life, I've always, I just do things. I just you know I'm just doing the thing you know, and I just didn't occur to me. So when I get into sort of formal collective settings, I have a very difficult time fitting into their structure. I just don't believe in that kind of. I don't believe in a formal structure. I believe I just believe in informal right. structures. Um, it doesn't mean that, but it doesn't mean I, I think that they can't do that. Certainly they can, and they've and you know those structures have been you know immensely successful in you know making a lot of things happen. You know, and for the left and the right, frankly, um, uh, political and in other forms. But for me, I just don't. I just can't. I just don't fit in there. I just I can't do it. Um, and I think that you know I think that. I think about what Steve was talking about in terms of, you know, calling people on their bullshit. And I think that because of my like sort of, like I'm I'm you know I'm I have a, I'm a musician, but I'm a well known sort of like I you know I'm, I have a kind of like spokespersony kind of role, um, and I feel like that it is it's really tricky for me. Like I feel like when I read like when Steve and I read your stuff, I always think like. You have like a, you're you're knowledgeable and you speak with an authority, you know. Whereas I am often like my I'm speaking with like a just like a what I think, you know. I haven't really done the math on this shit. Whereas I feel like you really know, like you've thought about stuff in a way. Uh, well, I try to give um, that impression. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's you certainly do give me that impression that you're like you know you've thought about it like the nuts and bolts of things. Whereas I'm much more like I'm just talking about like a, I have a different sort of like, I'm thinking about like the the basic. For me, my principle on it, like how I, how I, how the way I would navigate a situation. That's all. Um, but I also think that I have been the subject of such ugly, like ad hoc attacks. You know, you know. I mean, I've had people write songs that are you know about me, where my name is in the song that just basically you know says, Fuck "Yeah, you. I can and, check you know, all of those boxes as well." Yeah. <laughs> right, and it's just yeah, it just makes you you know you start to feel like. I feel like that is just 
I just don't, for me, I just don't see any use in responding to that kind of nonsense. Not that you did, but I'm just saying, so I always just, I just stay the fuck away from all that mess. I just don't The way I've always sort of thought of that is that, like, I can think of people in my life, or people that I have opinions about that I've never met and never interacted with, just people from, for like, for no real reason, like, you know, I. I kind of think Sylvester Stallone is a jerk. Like, I'm, I mean, I, I have no reason to think that. I don't know that. I, don't, I know nothing about him. I've used this example before. And, uh, like, just mm-hmm. off the top of my head, somebody said, like, what do you think of Sylvester Stallone? He's probably a dick, you know? I don't know why I think that. Mm-hmm. But but it, in some small way, in some tiny slice of the music scene, I'm somebody's Sylvester Stallone. Like, for whatever reason, they think I'm a dick. Right. And I'm... And I, I don't want to deny anybody whatever mild, whatever slight pleasure that is. I mean, when I think, you know, if I think about Sylvester Stallone being a dick, it gives me a you know, modicum of satisfaction <laughs> to think that in, in one tiny aspect of life, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'm a better person than Sylvester Stallone in some way. You know, sure, he's more famous, has more money, can afford surgery, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not a dick and maybe he's a dick. So, like, I feel like I don't want to rob anybody of that. So, like, I tend to let people have... Like opinions about me are for other people. I don't really, I'm, you know, I don't really want to get into that game. It's not, it's none of my business what other people think about me. I would agree with you, but the difference is, but let me speak to that because there's a, I have a, it'd be one thing if I was, you know, the, you know, like I feel like, you know, I don't know, the, the, the prime minister of, of, you know, whatever, some European country is a shithead. That's two different, you know, worlds. Like nobody who's interviewing him is going to ask him what he thinks about, He's not, what do you think about the fact that some kid from Washington, D.C., or a guy from Fugazi doesn't like him? I think that what I run into problems, and this is what I don't like about people who spend their time to idly fucking taking shots at me, is that I have to spend my time dealing with other people asking me about it or saying, what do you think about so-and-so? And I don't think, you know, it's, it's, it's a waste of my fucking time, honestly, mm-hmm, to be, mm-hmm, have some, mm-hmm. some fucking tourist just talking shit about me on their way up to where they think they're going to go. Um, and then people saying like, well, what's your response? I have no response for them. I'm just not going to engage. And I think that, that it's ironic, but especially now with the, in the internet world, you know, that you know, there was recently, you know, there's, there's been a few like internet frenzies, you know, that involved me. Um, most of which, you know, now occur in the social media world, but certainly before were just like, you know, they're just whatever, like, you know, website-y, whatever kind of things. But, um, and, you know, shit will just spread so fast. And then people, like, I would get like dozens of emails would be like, how do you respond to this? And I have no, I'm just not going to get involved in it. I'm just not, and, and that's for me, the irritation is like, they're what this person's idly doing wherever they wherever they are they, this person is idly taking a shot at me or they're just trying to like get their like bones like i mean they're taking advantage of my work to get more attention to themselves and then i'm supposed to actually do promotional work for them and i think well fuck that i am not <laughs> going to be involved and and in the case of like there's one situation where i remember i got a call from like four or five people and they're like oh my god you're you're being destroyed online. Like you're just, you're, you're, you're getting destroyed. Are you okay? I'm like, I said, I'm fine. Cause I'm not looking at the computer right now, you know? <laughs> and then I, I looked and then I started getting emails from all these like fucking ghosts. Do you remember the what the issue was? Do you remember? Like- oh yeah. It was the urban outfitters, minor threat. Oh, right, right, urban right. Outfitters issue. And, these people from the past were writing me and going like, I'm so disappointed in you. You know, I always <laughs> thought you were sort of a sellout. And I was just like, I'm just not going to respond. I'm not, you know, but this went on all day. All day it went on. Like people writing me and either to attack me or they had read about it or to say they were so dis- disappointed in me or they are concerned about me. And I think, what the fuck do people, that they must be sitting at desks and have nothing to do in their lives. And, right. and so I started thinking about this and I realized someone... I remember like a week later, there was some German people showed up at Discord to visit. I didn't know them. There's some fan people that came by. And this guy said to me in a very thick German accent, he said, um, so, you know, I, how do you explain to you the uh, urban outfitters, you know, whatever his German accent. But he was, I couldn't, I finally realized he's talking about this urban outfitters thing, right? And I said, I just, I, I said to him, I was like, listen, I go, that was 
that was a street, that was like a gang fight in an aquarium. I said, the fish were fighting the fuck out of each other. And they knocked over the castle, and they knocked over the plants, and the gravel has been displaced. But for people who are not in the aquarium, not a drop of water got them on them. Hmm. It's just, this is like, a something is happening now. Like, I appreciate... I appreciate the exchanges. I, I, I like the idea that people can communicate with each other, but the the, um, the intensity of the kind of attacks and the momentary quality of them, I think, is deeply unhealthy. Like it's like what's going on now, like with this kind of. I think it's really bread and circus. You mean it's the like people sort of caught inter- up the sort of internet pylon scenario? Yeah, and yeah. I think that people just jump on because they don't know what else to do with their lives because really people are out of feel no sense of control. They have no sense of – they just don't have any sense that they actually have a place in this world. They, the people live on, on – a they they're, they jump on shit so hardcore. Everyone weighs in on something. I mean, funny. I remember when Rollins got into so much trouble because he wrote um, this – he wrote a column about Robin Williams. And he, right. he said something like, you know, somebody – like a parent, somebody who has a children, like he thinks it's, it's cowardly to kill themselves. Mm-hmm. And – People went berserk on him. Like, they just went totally berserk and saying, you know, he didn't understand depression. And, I mean, frankly, I think Henry understands depression. And, um, you know, Henry, you know, I think his point was salient. And I think most of the people who critiqued him didn't actually read the column. What they read was the other person, people's somebody, the crit- whoever was angry at Henry said, like, he says that people who commit suicide are cowards, which is not what he said. Right. But that's what. So that's the kind of shit. And I think that in, all of this in is, his defense. This might be this. This might be cataloged as like the first time I've come to the defense of Henry Rollins. But the, in his defense, w- when he saw all of those criticisms, yeah. like the 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 fundamental criticism was that y- you know you shouldn't judge someone who's been driven to something by depression. You shouldn't judge that person based on that the disease and what the disease drove them to right and when he read those criticisms he took them to heart and yeah. he no. and he wrote a response that i thought was actually a, a pretty like it was big of him to to own up to how insensitive he had been and the way that he you know whether he had a, a specific point or not uh the way like using robin williams as an example using a recent tragedy as a as a, a way to underscore it all that sort of stuff it made it come off really bad, and he owned up to it. I thought that was pretty big of him. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. And I mean, and you know, and, you know, Henry and I are we're best friends for we've been you know best friends since I was eleven. So like I've you know, for, and I was really you know aware of what was you know I had heard you know, I knew what was going on. And but I think mostly what I came away from from that ex, that whole that experience, and also the other thing that is it that there people are so caught up in the pile on um and i start to think about this idea that is you know you know it's like between that and like the, like insane focus on on food in our culture like just you know every week every, any weekly that still exists only writes about you know ale new ale houses and, and places to get like artisanal beef stew or whatever the fuck <laughs> um i feel like that these i feel like this is like the pure bread and circus like people give the people give the masses something to occupy their mm-hmm. minds while we fucking dissemble the world and i think that and i think it's really interesting cuz it's like so removed from like the era where i feel like people were really were thinking the so called politically correct people were really like thinking about the world and thinking about how they live in a way like how they live and what changes they could make in their lives that would not like continue this sort of like the, the decline or whatever well I, I'm not a, I, I have to say i think that like all of these are manifestations of things that are there that have been there all along and nothing is different about the current internet thing other than the speed with which information travels right. and the distances that it can go instantly the the internet pylon is precisely the same as the angry letter to the editor which took you know, a week to get into the newspaper. It's but it's it's exactly precisely the same. But it also you know? takes but it also takes paper uh, pen to paper, 
paper to fold, fold the envelope to the address to walk down the street with a stamp. Exactly. And like put the, it in the, the ease, internet has done right. nothing but increase the speed right. and ease of things. It hasn't changed culture. It hasn't changed the way people respond to each other, what their interests are. And I mean, the. the or maybe it's just magnified the worst elements of it then. Well, I mean. It, it's just access. I think it's access. You have access to. Yeah. I mean, the, the internet provides access to things. And what, one, of the, one of the things that it provides access to is it provides access other people access to to me with their stupid fucking ill-considered opinions you know and that that's right that's what it, the internet does i don't think it's changed i don't think anything about it is different from the way it was i mean we're having conversations about um propriety and language and those exact same conversations are you know put Lenny Bruce in jail. Right. So like, that's true. That there's, there's literally no difference in my mind between, you know, the way the culture behaves toward uh, discourse now and the way it behaved toward discourse a hundred years ago. The, the biggest difference is that we can all see more of it now. Right. And we can all see more of that, of the, of the meta commentary as well. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not concerned about a, a, a cultural shift. And I, 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 and I, would, and I actually, I, I appreciate that, and I actually, I would agree with you. I think that it is. I still feel like that there's a. I think I don't think there's a cultural shift. Like the thing that the internet has changed society. What I think is that it's magnified an aspect of society that people now think. At least let's put it this way: people that I, my peer group, the people that I'm in touch with, I'm just, I'm, you know, I find I quite often am surprised how removed they feel from everything, but partially because they've removed themselves because they don't need to be involved. There's no actual, like, there's no real conversation. That's all. Like, well, you know, it's, I, it's, I, it's, again, I would disagree. I think a lot of those conversations have been displaced toward text messages and emails and, and things like that. Instead of instead of engaging with the people immediately around you, you can engage with people anywhere in the world. And, you know, the argument is, well, people are bar- have their nose a bit, noses buried in their phones. They're not interacting with other people. Well, what they're interacting with through their phone is other people. And I, and I, I don't see this. I don't see this great, like, shift that i i hear bemoaned by a lot of other people a lot of people who predate the internet era and i'm not per- deeply vested in the internet myself well i'll point out that i can put but i'll point out that vish didn't ask us all just to text in our answers and this conversation would be a lot different if we were just typing it in you know i think that there's a difference between actually having you know sonic interaction talking with each other whether it's on the phone or in person now, don't get me wrong i fucking I write email all day long. I'm not against. I'm not. I'm not a luddite. I don't disagree with. I don't think the internet should be shut down. It's nothing like that. I actually think there's just a different. I think people have a different idea about discourse. And I, you know, I think that there's no question. It's, it's convenient to like. You know, I did a, a Skype interview with, or a Skype conversation with somebody in fucking Norway the other day, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> like, it's amazing. It's right. it's like a miracle. This could even happen. I appreciate and I appreciate that. Um, and I frankly, I appreciate phones like the fact that i'm in washington and you're in chicago and you're in guelph are you in guelph still yes i'm in guelph yeah right so the fact that three of us can sit here and and chew the fucking fat is it's incredible and i'm very thankful for it and i'm thankful for the internet and the gifts that it has brought along i i don't however i also think that the safety of one-way communication um has really has brought about a certain tonality that i think is is uh, less less than positive in terms of the overall conversation that's just my my sense you know that people you know like when somebody gets into a fight you know when they're getting into an argument with somebody or they're, they're breaking up with like a couple's breaking up and then they just write the worst stupidest shit because they don't have to think about they didn't first of all, they didn't think about it to begin with because they could just pop it off right away and second off they don't have someone sitting right there to say, like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, right. and maybe it's fine. Maybe it's more elongated. Maybe it'll all get worked out. I don't think it's into the world. I just think it's it's just a, a it's it's problematic in terms of actually um, it's problematic in, in terms of it actually doing some kind of constructive like I guess I come from my world is like being connected to people in a way that is more physical or friendship like you know like my affection for you steve is is to is really you know like it's kind of a permanent affection like if i and if you and i could find ourselves um in the same room um 
at any time, I would be so happy, you know. And doesn't mean, but I don't have to fucking like we don't email each other that often, or we right. don't write to. For me, it's like it's like it's the actual quality of sitting down with people that is really what I. That's always been what I've been about, and um, and so I think that that there's you know I do interact with people online on like emailing and stuff like that, and so there's that that those relationships do exist. But ultimately, I think that if people retreat entirely into that kind of world or largely into that world, then then I feel like there's then there's a certain kind of activism or kind of connectivity that makes it much more difficult for like sort of larger things to occur. Like I don't know if we may never see a uh, something is um, you know I mean the early American punk scene was significant. It was a significant gathering of people that really felt interconnected hence this fucking phone call right right i and I've, so i I've, think that's the kind that gets more i mean i don't know exactly how the, but that also has to do with the the vastness of the internet and like the incredible amount of options you know that you people could do anything at any time and anywhere you know that kind of thing so there's it's a different issue but i'm not i don't mean to bemoan it no i just i just, I just feel it. like yeah. there is a, it's it's easy to mistake a change in form for a change in substance and i just feel like at the moment, it used to be like people would say angry things under their breath, and now they put them on Twitter or Facebook, and it, and so it, and it used to be that that people would you know share things with a, a small personal group of people, and now they just share them publicly, and the, and I feel like the form of discourse is changing somewhat, but the the impulses are the same, and the and the you know I mean it's easy to point to specific examples of activism that couldn't have happened without the interconnectedness of the internet you know like no question and don't 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 deny that and no so i feel like the you know i i don't i don't necessarily feel like there's any anything special like temporarily special about now i feel like we're basically the same as we've always been what about the anonymity yeah, I don't know about well, that. Well, I, don't know. I mean, there's always been aspects of anonymity. I mean, the Klansmen wore hoods, you know. That, I mean, I don't, I don't think well, there's anything say, unique about that. Doesn't speak very well for commenters, that. does it? You know, I mean, that's exactly, I think that's the point. Like, you know, you have to at least, like, I know in the Discord website to comment, you have to log in, and people yeah, have really, right. really raged at us. But we also haven't had a lot of people talking about white power. You know, it's like we just don't right. get that kind of nonsense going on. And also, and just going back to what you said about. Saying stuff under your breath. The reason it's under your breath is because it's just better fucking left there, frankly, for the most part. Because usually those people who say that shit later on, they're like, "Oh, it was not that big of a deal." But if once they, but if they have to immediately espouse like their worst feeling about something, then it becomes a dialogue, and then the dialogue is then like so. Then the people just end up arguing about some fucking stupid thing that should not have been bothered to say in the first place, which is I think is a waste but of the, time. The- well, yeah, but I, I mean, one of the uh, the other great thing about the internet is because it's so vast, yeah. you can waste some of it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the productivity of the rest of it. And it, you only it, only by a, you you have to actively choose to waste your time on it. And you've done the intelligent thing, and by carving off a portion of it and saying, "Well, I'm just not interested in that," and that that prevents you from wasting your time. But right. for the people who are involved in it, like it animates them in some way, no question. and and in the same way that I can I I can think Sly Stallone is probably a dick, uh, then I think and it you know that amuses me uh, for some brief portion of the day. Then I I don't have any problem with that stuff going on in some slice of the internet that I'm not paying attention to. You really fixated on Sylvester Stallone. I don't know why. That's yeah. strange. I don't, <laughs> I don't really understand that. I also before before but before, before, before let me just point out one thing while we're at just I mean. The fact that we like spent a half an hour talking about Al Jurgensen and then another half an hour or forty minutes talking about the fucking <laughs> internet that's that says that says what it says. You know, I feel like that the like you know I remember when are you saying that we've blown it? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I remember in the early nineties, like when bands when the everyone started. Can we signing. talk about the cramps instead. But well, yeah, well, I just want to say is that, what I was saying is like I remember when major labels sort of started swooping in that era. And I realized yeah, I was that like, was something hideous, has wasn't? really changed, and it's not just the fact that band are signing, but I realized it changed the discourse. Like when we talked about, like you and I were talking about the Butthole Surfers earlier, and I remember when I first saw them. I saw I saw them in the Whiskey in Los Angeles in 1982. They still had a trap. They had a regular drum guy playing a trap kit. They had a bass player. It was like a different. It was like, it was just King and and um, Gibby, um, or not King, um, Paul and Gibby, and then a bass player and a drummer. It was, and they were so 
weird. And I remember just telling people about them and just talking about the ideas and like these songs. And I realized that so much of the time, like the discourse, what people talked about was always about like, like these ideas, these people, like these presentations, the performances, songs, the sounds, and describing the, all this stuff. And that was really what people talked about. And then I remember in the early 90s, suddenly the conversation shifted when almost every conversation was about... People were talking about deals. The fucking deal and the contracts, the money and like and whatever. And, they right. got, and I remember that there was such a shift. In a way, I feel like that is like... Every time I do a Q&A, somebody says, what do you think of Spotify or whatever the fuck? And I think right, so right, right. interesting. People still want to talk about the deals. They still want to talk about the deal, right. Well, we're, we're metric obsessed, right? We've never been – it's never been – used to know when, when I was growing up, you would maybe know how well a film did on its opening weekend or record sales. But now it's like real time. Like, oh, like you can watch how many views this gets on YouTube, how many spins it gets on Spotify Speak for yourself. Like, I don't give a fuck about that stuff. Yeah. When you say we're obsessed, yeah. I don't give I, a I, fuck I, at all about that stuff. I don't. The, care. the other day, uh, the other day, I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be supremely meta here and say the other day I I tweeted something to my like group of nine friends that I have that follow me on Twitter or whatever <laughs> um, that the use of likes as a metric is the PR equivalent of using. I can't even as an argument. <laughs> like they're they're for, they're both like so perfectly of this time and so perfectly free of any real meaning. Yeah, you know. And can I let me point out something? Just why? Just so I can lick Steve's ass for a second here, um, <laughs> because you know, anybody can why pick I up, anybody I can pick up a guitar know. and strum it. You know, and then there's other people who like. You know, they may not make any sound that may, sounds right or good or whatever to, to to other people, maybe. And then there's people who can, like, they can play a song. You know, they can play a song. And maybe they're even good. They're talented guitar players. You know, and then there's people who are, like, they're musicians. And they're, 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 they're thinking, their relationship with the music and they're, with their instruments is, like, it's transcendent. Like, they, they, like, that's where they're at. Like, that's, like, you, and you can tell that when you see that. And I think in the same way, like, like I think of you, like I think of Steve is very much like you as like somebody who is, like you have a really like y your perception that like your way of organizing your words and the way you think about things is really entertaining and refreshing and thoughtful and so like for you like when you get into when you have a public saxophone like the Twitter thing, right? You are well suited for it. Like, you know, you'd be, if I could give a fuck about Twitter, I would follow you. I'd be the 10th motherfucker that follows you. <laughs> and because yeah, you're I actually. Keep it private so that I can talk shit about people without ending up on Pitchfork. Right, because you're. <laughs> so it's a, right. Which, which, and so I think that, like, in a way, like, I don't think, like, I think there's a place for that stuff. Like, I think, and I, and I, you know, I think the difference is that sometimes people, like, when they they write songs, it's because it's coming out of them. And it's pure. And sometimes they write songs, they want people to look at them. And it's about them, not about the song. And I think in the same way, in, in, in being declarative and, and, and being a, cr a critical thinker like you are, or being a, and, and speaking out about things, like, I feel like your ideas, it's not about how great you are. It's always about, like, the idea, like, this is a really, this is a bon mot. Like, you're fucking putting it out there to the world. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's like it's too delicious to not share it, like a Dorothy Parker kind of thing. And I I agree with that. I think it's you know I appreciate I even I appreciate it. Um, that's why I said like when I got that that thing you wrote um, to Rabo, I was like wow that's like I just like I like the you know you you organize your words and thoughts in a way that I'm like I really appreciate it. even when I don't necessarily agree, although I usually do, but I still think like God damn he's a good thinker. And I'm glad that I'm glad that you have a, a, um, a medium in which you can share your thoughts because I think it's good for the world. You know that I just I you know in the same so I feel like that is, you know, it's not again I don't I think the problem is that there's, you know, this whole other segment of society, who just think it's important to know what like what we need to know what the fuck what, what they think about Kim Chi I don't care what the fuck they think about Kim Chi <laughs> it's irrelevant you know and I don't want to and I don't care if people like or dislike. So, Steve, uh, Ian has said some very nice things about you to wrap this up. Do you have something particularly nice you can say about Ian? <laughs> yeah, this is my – was, it was a fishing expedition. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's – during the during the punk and especially during the hardcore era, there were a lot of blowhards, like a lot of people who 
like took to their tiny little pulpit to tell the world what they thought, right? And I always thought the thing that distinguished Ian was not that he told other people what to do or how to think or how to believe, but he demonstrated day in and day out that you could be an honorable person, treat other people decently, and build a system that wasn't just a dollhouse version of the mainstream culture, but was like a completely separate and viable alternative existence. And, I mean, it was maybe the best example of it. Um, what always bothered me about the the way that punk started to assimilate into the mainstream's culture is that you had you had people who were like had some history in the music scene or had some history in, in punk or whatever and then you know they'd become a realtor they'd become a lawyer or whatever and they'd be like you know I, I, I'm the punk rock realtor you know right or I'm <laughs> uh, I'm the I'm the punk rock lawyer you know and the or or you there would be like bands would have managers or there or there'd be like a a publicist or something like that and these 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 would be people that came from this indigenous punk scene and had sort of created offices for themselves you know like booking agencies or you know representatives of one kind or another just like as though the point of the underground culture and punk was to mimic the the big boy music business somehow, right. and that the worst aspects of it that always irritated me. Like when you know, like a photographer would take pictures of a band and then like insist on credit and copyright and so much per use and all this kind of stuff, like. You know, sort of this creeping professionalism started to get started to, to take hold in the punk scene, and I I always admired and respected the way Ian and Discord, as an embodiment of Ian's sort of ethos, kept things at a very very human scale. Mm-hmm. Like you could call and speak to mm-hmm. him, call that record company and speak mm-hmm. to him on the telephone. Basically anybody, you could write a letter and get a response. Um, if you wanted one of their records, you could get one of their records from them, from anywhere in the world. You know, it it wasn't about creating a, a their own competitive version of the music scene. It was uh, of the music industry. It was a way of demonstrating that the music industry was wrong and unnecessary. And I kind of feel like uh, every now and again, you see that you see that thing sort of reassert itself where like uh, people from the underground gravitate toward the mainstream and and presume that their history is all that all that's necessary you know and then uh, it it always it always bothered me when people would sort of you know filthy the the scene that I thought was so important by associating it with all of these crass like music business and and capitalist impulses and that i guess that's the most inspirational thing about ian for me is just demonstrating that you know you can carry on doing things on a human scale basically forever you know no, I'll say. yeah i think you've both spoken about aspects of each other that i certainly can relate to about both of you so i it's and I think that says something too. But to me, that I appreciate what you've said. Um, this is maybe a weird question, but do you foresee? Because we've sort of talked about how your your work has intersected over the years. I don't imagine you've had too many conversations like this uh, recently. But do you foresee a time where you might share a stage or work on a project together again? Yeah, I don't know. I think we both. I think both of us have really successful. Like we both have been. We both are hard workers. And part of that work is really, I think, we very much have our own orbits. Like, we just work. Like, I know, I mean, I know Steve. I mean, I'm quite sure. I know what I do, and I'm quite sure Steve. Like, we, we've we created something that we have to tend to. We have a custodial responsibility right, right. to these things. 
Um, and, That's and one way to it, put like, it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, part of it's a li- it's a livelihood. Yeah. But it's also something. It's like, you know, you're we're fucking. We made something we want to look after. We're not. Yeah. You know, we don't want because you know what. What you you know, what you do informs what you've done and what you you know, and that's I feel like that's really for me it's important, especially with the, with a record label. I feel really since I I know that my life is very unusual compared to most people, at least mm-hmm. around here for sure. Um, and that is, you know, not only you know, obviously I've been in bands that were fairly successful and, and, and on their own terms, but also, you know, there's been you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Who have entrusted me with their music, and that by doing so has allowed me to live a life that's very unusual compared. I, you know, I basically can decide my own what I want to do with it each day. It's like it's up to me, and um, and I feel that for for a long time, for many years, that was, um, you know, we were just selling so many records. It was just easy just to do that. Now, as, a, as you know, the label is, gets long in the tooth, you know, and it, as, because the label is. You know, really a reflection of a living, a living thing. Um, it is in itself kind of a living thing, and it will die because of that. And so, and it's, you know, I'm not. This is not to say the label is going to disappear in the next year or two, but it's certainly, you know, we're a smaller, much smaller than we've ever been, and or at least since the very beginning. And um, you know, now would be the time to be like, oh, I don't, I don't want to deal with this anymore. But now I actually feel like, okay, now like this is where, you know, you really got to show. Like this is where, you know. You got to show that you're you meant it. Like I fucking these people entrusted me with their music, and I feel like as long as there are people in the world who are interested in getting copies of these records or hearing this music, I feel like I have a responsibility to try to keep it going for long as long as possible. You know, like not and not in a gross way, but in a really a, a thoughtful way that make not ever stepping out of line with our general principles, but also um, not speculating on stupid things and wasting money on you know that's always been the way we survived so long the label in De- in december will be th- it'll be 35 years we've had this label and wow. um yeah. and you know it's like and you know we put our first record on december of 1980 um we don't i don't believe in anniversaries i don't celebrate them and i don't i never had like a 20th or 25 i don't give a fuck about that kind of stuff the only thing we ever did like that on any level was we put out the 20 years of discord box set um right. which was Really was, really in my mind was an attempt to had two folds. One was to show that the label was not Minor Threat and Fugazi and Ian MacKay, but it was actually this vast number of people that were involved. And the other thing was that in the early days of um, the label, and you know that uh, you know we were constantly being people would say, "Oh, well, you can do this for now," like you're, but it's too idealistic. You're not going to last. And they kept, I mean, we often ridiculed for the way we went about doing things. Like I've never, you know, I don't have a lawyer. I've never, never used contracts, mm-hmm. you know. And you know, we just like we didn't copyright shit. We all that kind of stuff. We just did that. We just did things. And I think that people, you know, we were often told like, "Well, that's just not. It's not sustainable." So when we hit the 20 year mark, I kind of wanted to point out like, "Are we real yet?" After right, twenty right, years, right. It, is it that was sort of a but but in terms of it being celebrating an anniversary, I just, that's not interesting to me because I, right. I just want to work. So I feel like that now you know I have a responsibility to to the, you know the members of Youth Brigade or to the members of <laughs> Deadline or or Q and Not You all these people who said soccer team don't forget soccer yeah, team. soccer team like all these people who basically like you know really like you know some years some some people three decades ago. Basically, ever since, have allowed me to like put their music out and handle it. That's insane. You know, they've never and we've never yeah. had any problem. Nobody. We've never been sued. We don't have any beef with anybody. I feel like this is like I feel like now like the custodial responsibility is for real. And I think that you know like Steve and I like you know like when they come to town like shall I come to town, which is you know one of my favorite bands. So when they come, I'm always going to be. Like, if they play Baltimore. I go to Baltimore to see them. You know because. I love them as people, and I love their band, and and it's just so refreshing to see a band like that um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because they're still they bring they are they are there for a reason, and the reason is not just to play a show, and um, and uh, I think that there's you know I feel like I'm always I think we will, I'm surely we'll see each other. I mean I have no idea in what capacity we would ever work together, but. Um, I don't fucking know. I would be, be <laughs> nice you know, if we lived in the same town, but that's the way. That's the way. That's the curse of the jet age. You know, if we didn't fly around, we wouldn't know each other. Yeah, my. I mean, for me, the 
day-to-day obligations are uh, a little more mundane. Like I don't get to decide what I do every day. I'm I'm scheduled to do things months in advance. And but you get to decide to do that. Well, I, mean, I can decide that now that I'm like what I want to do in July, basically. Right. Um, but but f- and on my end, it's it's not a custodial responsibility. It's a it's a uh, an active responsibility in that I have to earn thirty grand a month, or this place goes under, and all right. all the people that work here, who people who I admire and would trust with my life, like all those people can't make rent if I if we go under. So I have a I I have. That as an obligation as a business owner to keep, you know, to keep our head above water for mm-hmm. the the good of all the people that work here. And then also I feel a, a responsibility to the music scene in Chicago. Like I feel like I have gotten so much from the music scene here. I've been, you know, treated so well by the music scene here. And I've been, had experiences that, you know, were utterly unique and you know, really important to my life because of the music scene here. And I feel the least I can do is make this place available as a resource. And it's been gratifying that we've lasted as long as we have. And in the same way that Ian describes, the way that we go about it is different from the way that, you know, industry professionals go about it. And uh, it's gratifying that we're still here 20 years later and that all the industry professionals are all out looking for work. You know, it's, it is gratifying to be right about your um, your core beliefs and to demonstrate day in, day out that you can carry on doing things in a way that you're comfortable with and in a way that you think is responsible without it being risky without it being as as risky as doing something more conservative or more more conventional mm-hmm. and so that's you know that that makes me feel good about the way things are going but my obligations are a little bit more mundane like i i don't i don't get to have the experience of being responsible for the stewardship of uh, an immense catalog what i do get to do is i get to the satisfaction on a sort of a daily basis I get to see people realizing their life's ambition, you know. Day in and day out, bands come in here that have been dreaming about that moment for months, that they're right. going to come into the studio and make a record, and then, then perhaps that they can share their creative impulse with the whole world, you know. And that's really gratifying. To be in the, in a position to see people realize that ambition again and again is – I've described it as being like watching kids open their Christmas presents. And it is exactly, precisely like that. You're like somebody gets something that they've always wanted and I get to help them get it, you know. So that's – it's tremendously gratifying as a job. But it is a grind when you realize that you have this – thing hanging over you that you you must do like i literally must earn a thousand dollars every day come hell or high water right i have and if i don't then they come and take all this stuff away from me and i lose my house and all my friends are out of work you know and so that Mm. there's a, a heaviness to it that is offset by the sensation of accomplishment that I get to see and that I get to experience on a regular basis. I think that for, and, and though you know, our circumstances may be, you know, differing in, in, in certain aspects of it, I think that ultimately, you know, I think that we, I like to think, at least I feel like this way, that basically, you know, when we, wait, we you know, when we, we wake up with something to do that we want to do, and maybe you don't, maybe you don't, you know, maybe there's days where you're like, or same with me, like, oh, I don't want to deal with this fucking work I have to do. But ultimately, we, it's like, we're not working for somebody else. Right. You know, and we're, and, and that, I think, like, I guess I feel like, you know, you, like, your dream was to, to, to open to, you know, to build and operate, like, a world-class studio. And... You're fucking doing it. So I don't, so yeah. I feel like you, when you wake up, so you might, you know, the, you know, the same way when I have to deal with like, I mean, there's plenty of, you know, I, I do actually run a business here and I have also have employees and I am, you know, obviously looking after, you know, I have to look after all these things, those people as well. And I have to deal with a lot of shit that I just don't like dealing with. Like, you know, obviously there's, you know, the thing ultimately as a boss, like I always feel like my job is to assist the people who work at Discord. 
Um, and I'm and I'm the person like the boss from in my mind is the person who does the thing that nobody else wants to do. Right. Like deal with like tax crap, whatever. And and so then I think that's 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 my job. And but I also know that I get to do what I want to do. And that is that's rare for, you know, in, in, in our world where I think most people I mean, really what, what in our society, I, I feel like what has happened is that, you know, business has 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 taken ownership of people's time. So people don't feel like they own their own time. And that is criminal mm -hmm. that people don't they feel like that they that they're they from eight to six or whatever, you know, and, and now, you know, beyond that, given the devices that they just don't own their own right. time. Um, and I feel really strongly that, you know, I believe in the idea of pe that people own their own time. And even my staff, like they it's like their time. And I feel like that's really, really important. So I feel that like this idea of we all have ob we have obligation to course, but ultimately, like what we do, we do what we want to do. And that's that's that is an incredible gift and a gift. I don't mean and I never say, you know, I'm not fucking lucky. I work too hard to be mm -hmm. lucky, but it's a gift. <laughs> you know, it's a gift. Yeah, I am in, in in the same way that you feel like a sense of identity with you, the place where you are and the people that are from where you are. Like, I, you know, I feel, uh, I feel, I that if it, if not for Chicago, I wouldn't have been able to do all the things that I've done. Like, if I had picked a different city to land in I would have been in a different crowd of people and the, the particular crowd that I was in here were supremely inspirational and no question and and you know if there are just so many of those little serendipitous things that I can't help but feel like uh, you know I, I'm in I, I'm grateful to circumstance that I ended up where I did and in the cr company that I ended up with instead of a different crowd. Like so many little things could have changed in my life. Like, you know, if I had failed to meet this one person, then I would have failed to make that one connection and then I would not have been doing what I'm doing with my life. And, uh, right. you know, the, the least I can do is not blow it from here you know i feel like it was such a fragile scenario and so such a, a a pure chance thing that i ended up having the opportunities that i did that if i blow it now i feel like i will have wasted all of that so i i'm mm. i'm trying to keep it going not just because it's satisfying but because I, I feel like it's you know it's a it's doing justice to what enabled me to get here in the first place. And and by the mm. same token, uh, I think both of you are aware of how much your work has meant to me and, and, and the way you conduct yourselves. And, and Well, if you keep saying it, I we know, will be. Yeah. I know, yeah. yeah. But I do appreciate your, your being on this show and all the time you've uh, given me over the years, and I hope this was fun. And I hope it recorded. <laughs> <laughs>